<laughs> okay. We're part here laughing two. because we just heard part one of Phil Hartman, and we <laughs> and have part parties. two coming up. This yes. is a continuation with even more special guests. And uh, we had a lot of people who wanted to talk to Phil that um, either couldn't get to the Groundlings or we couldn't fit that many people on the stage. So there's some great SNL cast members and people associated with SNL that talk about Phil Hartman's brilliance. We'll talk about Phil. We're going to meander around and just crack each other up. Um, so overall, it's just a, it's a lot. Yeah, of we go off. Fun. We let we let it go off on a lot of different tangents. There's some interesting stuff uh, around one particular show called The Simpsons. Maybe you've heard of that, oh, yeah. David. <laughs> Talk about that a lot, also. Okay, you guys, here you go. William Farrell is our guest today. Yeah, or should it be Willie? Willie Willie yeah. Farrell, as Lauren Michaels would call him. <laughs> Willie Farrell is always good. <laughs> Will anything this week? Didn't he say you were in the top two recently? He's oh. in the top two. Did I no, say he, he? What did he say? Top three. He told me. He told me. <laughs> he told All me, time. I have to put you in the top three. <laughs> in which order? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> that's good though. I mean, that's still pretty good. He goes. Yeah. You're in the top. He told me. He goes. You're in the top three chunks of 30 yeah you're in the lower 30 30 percent quadrant uh let's um, let's ask there, you know there's danny there's eddie there's there's the usual suspects uh mike you know, maybe you would did john yes. died and that sort of pushed him toward the top <laughs> oh my god hey talk about will being in the top three sorry phil Phil Hartman is our focus of this episode, and he, what was his latest ranking? But it was definitely, might have been top five. I don't know. He's up six. there for sure. Yes. You know, I, you guys are so, it's so cool that you're doing this only because my wife and I recently, and I think it was, I think it was with our kids and a couple of their buddies were referencing Phil Hartman and they had huh. no idea. <laughs> who, who he was and i we were like wait you guys don't know phil hartman and so anyway it just it just dawned on me that he's he's one of the greatest ever to do the show that because of the circumstances of what happened to him i, I don't know if the comedy world still knows you know how impactful he was and and just what a legacy he has uh, but he's still kind of unknown. That's why we did this. And yeah. it's because of you and Bill Hader or Sherry O'Terry. A lot of people just mentioned their admiration for Phil as one of the best sketch players mm -hmm. in the history of Saturday Night Live. But, but, well, it's right, because the insanity of what happened and how crazy and out of the blue yeah. was overshadowed a little bit. And then it was sort of hard to talk about. And then yeah. he was just hard to talk about. So it was sort of yeah. all... Uh, it was a tough situation, but I think time has gone by where it comes up so much now that it's time to give him some props and just remind everyone. Yeah. And we did, because uh, I lived around the corner, we were friends with with Bren and Phil and their kids, and we reached out to his daughter, Bergen, and she gave her a blessing. She went to the, to the live show, if people have listened to that episode, oh, that's at, great. at the Groundlings, which, yeah. by the way... I'd never been on that stage, but I'd been in, a, at a show yeah. or two. What an incredible room to do yeah. sketch comedy in! But she no, was there. It, yeah, it, so it's uh, that place is a uh, pretty pretty special place, and uh, just to, I mean, so many great memories. Even just doing because you do a lot of your, the classwork up on that stage too, uh, uh, and it's just you know what it's. 99 seats and it's just the audience is right there and uh um yeah so many great relationships were made you know at that school for me and and you'd look up on the wall and you see the the photos of of lovitz and hartman and lorraine newman hello and, uh Ewe herman and all these people uh but it's fine i was trying to think of the chronology of of like my exposure to phil but i remember i remember kind of taking a break from even watching SNL. And it wasn't until college when my roommate at the time was like, you've got to watch. He had done a Wayne's World sketch for his communications class. And I, and I was like, 
<laughs> what, what is this? What are you doing? He's like, oh, you don't know Wayne's World? I'm like, no, I haven't watched a show in a while. And so I started watching and it was it was really two things that brought me back to watching the show. And it was it was you and Mike, Dana, doing Wayne's World. That was like, you know, an epiphany in terms of, oh, my God, the show's back. Who are these guys and th- these characters? And then the second thing that brought me back, obviously, it was a very strong cast. But then this guy, Phil Hartman. and I, I just, I just was like, God, this guy is like so solid and everything. He's, um, he's really funny, but then he'll do something like the anal retentive uh, chef, uh, chef mm-hmm. which is so precise and is like, I mean, if you read that on paper, I don't know, maybe that got laughs in the room, but it's like, it's so technically done, but the fact that he just hung in the pocket with this really quiet premise and the audience just, he just brings them along in such a way. And, and the other thing I remember watching was, was Bill Clinton at the McDonald's and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> knowing how hard that is with props and going from, I think he uses like every part of the set and he mm-hmm. is having to yeah. grab, take a and bite, and <laughs> take a bite and you use it as an analogy that he's, you know, um, a warlord and you know aid to mogadishu and <laughs> this at one point starts choking i think schneider hands him like his coat <laughs> and uh to help him and but i i was like god that he was just so funny but also so technically gifted but um and i i just remember thinking oh that's you know if i ever could be on a show like that i'd love to be that guy uh, you did yeah. very, you did very, very well. No, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. You did great, but hey, no, Phil, Phil or you are people like you with that kind of range. It's like, <laughs> what couldn't Phil do? But I mean, you could question, throw anything at him. Yeah. Question yeah. for you guys. Mm-hmm. So when he was, was he, was he like a, was he like a quarterback of the, of the show in like a raw, raw way? Or was he, did he just kind of keep to himself and he was just so good? that the, the writers just knew they could always go to him for every type of sketch. He he was friendly and accessible, but he also was kind of private and he yeah. did, had a lot of hobbies that were yeah. more important to him than the sketch comedy. I'd never <laughs> seen anything like that. He was very organized about his bits and he could, you know, talk to you like about Evan Rude motorboats for a half hour and then say rehearsal, go up, do some accent, some character, some physical right. piece of comedy, play super broad or very realistic film, yeah. f- feature film type acting. So I, he was uh, interesting that way. Had no apparent ego about it. He just was great at it. But he'd rather be on, uh, flying his plane or on a boat. I mean, he just was Will is brilliant a little, at Will's it. Will's like that, I think. I don't know, Will. Uh, uh, I, I do think that you're... Because a lot of your characters are a little uh, out there and crazy. Are you, are you asking about my antique coin collection? Um. No. Do do, do you, you have actually one? have one, or is that being, no? I, I oh. wish. Yeah. No. Because my brother did. I have three older brothers, and then my brother Scott and I went in there one time and ravaged his coin collection. Oh gosh! He and, bought, have... and bought some jawbreakers at the, oh, at the mall. The oh, I'd fine. fucking kill and you! And it made the local paper. It was some dimes, uh, FDR dimes that were rare. We were, we were, I was nine. I, I apologize now to Brad. That's the guy who Garth is based on. Dude, full, if you, full, if you tried to take a, a run of my 1916 D Mercury dime in beautifully uncirculated condition, I'd fucking knock you out. That was worth 125 when I was in eighth grade, folks. So well, what was interesting is you and Bill Hader, yeah. the Coke and Pepsi of SNL, two extremely amazingly different, cool cats on SNL both referenced Phil Hartman as oh, being yeah. like, oh, Phil, you know, Phil's the man. And so that's also another reason we did the show. We thought, you know, he's spanning yeah, generations. I, I think um, my reverence for him affected me. I think I, I think I think I told this story when when we did the show at Largo, uh, but I'll tell it again, was when he came to host, we're all you know, there on Tuesday night and he's going in from office to office and listening to all the pitches. And, uh, I think it was in the office with a couple, a couple other writers and they were kind of, you know, doing all the talking. And 
I was I was a part of their pitch, but I didn't really have anything to add. They already they pretty much said what the idea was. In addition to be to being in, incredibly intimidated by being in the room with Phil Hartman, that he then just called it out, and he's like, "What's up with the feral kid? Dad got your tongue." <laughs> <laughs> and it was like Phil Hartman doing an impression of Phil Hartman. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And it was yeah. just, of course, that didn't, I just went, ah, yeah, well, you know, what they said. And I, <laughs> I was just like, God, he just must think I'm an idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's, he did. He was too, you know, he's such a nice guy. I, he, had, he had that voice or that persona he would, he would put on sometimes to when he wanted to lighten up the room. Hey, fellas. Make sure you read it funny. It was a little, little forties. Like him and Lovitz had that connection. Could we play something right yeah, now let's for play fun, that. Greg? This, this and, sketch, uh, Will, we're going to play you. We're going to surprise our guests oh, because you, you were, you were in, and I never saw it until a week ago, and I fucking oh. cracked up. And okay. put up the volume, please. <laughs> this okay. is just a piece of it. It's okay. just a piece. Last week, you were told <laughs> to set aside at least five hours a day observing human behavior. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do it, it's your loss. If you did, <laughs> congratulations. Troy, talk to me. Uh, yes, Bobby, I spent uh, five and a half hours watching a homeless lady. Shut up, get up. What are you working on? <laughs> um, I'm working on my weakness, which you said last week was voice and diction. So I thought I could sing A Whole New World from Disney's Aladdin. Good, Alan Menken, good friend of mine. You got music? No. Good, go. <laughs> I can open your eyes. <laughs> Take you wonder by wonder. Stop! Who are you? I'm Aladdin. I don't know. Are you? I am. <laughs> no, you're not. You're Troy. I'm Troy? Look at this. Look at this. This is something. <laughs> this is nothing. This is something. <laughs> this is nothing. This is something. <laughs> Kelly, who is he? Aladdin. Troy. Aladdin. Shut up, you're not listening. Brian, who is he? <laughs> Troy! Good. Aladdin! No, Troy! Good! Oh, you're sick. <laughs> oh, my God. So there you go. That's uh, he was. That's Phil in the pocket and playing it all, almost like he's in a movie. He's so yeah. committed and so real. You know? What Was he... Um, the other interesting thing about Phil was it, I don't think he came to comedy until a little late because i think he had a whole career as like a graphic design artist and everything like that mm. between voiceovers and graphic yeah. design he actually was one of the first groundlings that had a house yeah and he invited lovis to his house and he didn't really want to get famous according to john he was very conflicted about that he liked his life huh. and it had to be kind of pulled along when i got there phil was just going to be a writer and john kept saying to lauren and everybody no no he's because wow. he was he was a f famous at the Groundlings. I mean, uh, after eleven years, he was just dominant. You know. Yeah. It's interesting how many came aboard after Lorraine Newman, the first Groundling. Yep. And then it was John Lovitz, and then it was Phil in '86, and then it's like so many people. You know, Sherry O'Terrier, Chris Kattan, mm -hmm. you. I don't know. It's just like Lorraine came the other night. Yeah. Remember? Was she at the show? Yeah. Mm hmm. It's great. Did, uh, she left early, I heard. She left when I started to talk about something. Yeah, exactly. She, she, she thought, thought it was well. a tribute to David Spade. And when she found out it was <laughs> Phil, she quietly yeah. went out a side door. Because of how I much think. I was talking, she's like, what, what is this actually about? And I was like, yada da. -da. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, well, let's let Will let's let Will go. But I just, we wanted to thank Will for coming on. And I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but. Uh, I had to show you that sketch. We fucking cracked up. We saw that the other day. This is something. This is something. This is something that, and they had the rhythm away. It goes right back. You know, at a, is I, that? Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, well, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> tune my own horn here, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think Molly and Chris and I wrote that sketch. Whoa. Cause, yeah. oh yeah, he was a guest host. That was when he was hosting, yeah. right? Because it was based on different people, exactly. acting teachers you met. Yeah. Everyone, exactly. So someone really did that? This is something? This is nothing? This is something? <laughs> I think that was all Catan. Yeah. He so came up funny. with this whole thing of just, it, <laughs> just gibberish that, it, of course, an acting coach would throw at you. Right. 
And all the the ego stuff was so funny. Get up, get out, get out. And also just <laughs> everyone was his friend. And then the, there's the next little run on his friends all did uh, B-level guest parts on like Knight Rider, you know, and he has their credits as if they're a really big deal. Yeah. I, just, I just remember any acting coach I ever had in a group setting could not help themselves from talking about their projects. <laughs> <laughs> a Pringles commercial was his, yeah. cl- showed yeah. his range. And that's one time I, one time it was some, some class where one of the, one of the, one of the students was like, could you please give us an excerpt from your one man show? <laughs> and the teacher was like, I can't, I can't, please. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then sure enough, this guy goes on for five minutes of like from his one man show. The, about you guys writing that, that makes sense because Phil is a great writer. He wrote Pee Wee's Big Adventure with, with, yeah, that's Paul, right. but he was in so many things. And when you write something, you're kind of the de facto producer of that sketch. He just didn't have the time. Because he was in like nine things to show, even when he was parasailing hosting. after read through. <laughs> but you guys must have been <laughs> thrilled when he started started rehearsing that on and he Thursday. Nailed it. Well, it was just one of those things where it's like, oh, he's doing it exactly the way we pictured he'd do it. And yeah, and he looks ridiculous. He looks ridiculous. He's got yeah. that little beard. But anyway, well, right, thanks, one of the, thanks. One of the greats. Yeah. Hi, guys. Here's another all-star cast member and a good friend of mine, Mike Myers, who was very happy as a Canadian to come and talk about Phil Hartman. Here's Mike. A fellow Canadian. Oh, fuck. It's sort of a feeling in that in that building that you might get fired. It just washes over you no matter how it's how well it's going. If I watch the show, I'm gonna get fired. That's what I feel like. I feel like if if life is a boss that I could get fired at any time. You know, yeah, so it's true. <laughs> or sort of nicked. But um anyway, we're joined by Mike Myers. Hello. <sighs> Hold for applause. Yes. Who did a nice run. Mike, how long was your run with Phil? Was it your whole time there? Phil was there for five of the years that I was there. He left in my last year, I believe. He was in So I Married an Axe Murderer, which was fun and uh, just brilliant in it. And he did what Phil always did with anything, which is make it better than written. Yes. You know, he always brought stuff off the page. and, And he was also very, if you were one of the, more experienced um ivy league writers or if you were a dumb kid from toronto uh he sold your sketch you know what i mean and always made it better than written yeah i never wa- would never walk through no it. no he always tried to make something funny and he was always prepared he's the most prepared performer i've ever met in my life he had this old, i saw him he had a binder with with color coding, <laughs> like how musicians have notes, he would go a little bit of Charlton Heston plus a little bit of this, and you know, it was color coded. <laughs> I caught him. Oh, that's and great. I caught him. That's great. The other yeah. thing, too, is he had the best instrument of any uh, comedic actor I've ever met. His voice and his body was unbelievable. And uh, Peter Sellers, like, in my opinion, and Alec Guinness, like, and uh, mm-hmm. just one of those. Um, I thought he was a very good writer, and I thought he was one of the best interpreters of things written and best cold reader ever in my life. Yeah. You know what it, I mean? Uh, mm. So unnatural. You know, to that, to your point about Alec Guinness, because we were talking about that. The other day, a little birdie told me Phil had this move where he could make his eyes kind of go dead and and he would <laughs> go very he did it in So I Married an Axe Murder in the yes. Alcatraz scene. And if anybody yeah. out there wants to see uh first class film acting, comic acting, it's such a brilliant move. And Alec Guinness could make his eyes go kind of dead. I don't even know it, it I don't know what that is, but when Phil used it's it, comedic, yeah, complete control. Complete control. I think what you're talking about. Uh, Dana, before earlier, you're talking about how Farley was about explosion Mm -hmm. and not having any limits on yourself. Phil was Mm -hmm. almost the inverse and opposite. He was all about control. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, they always talk about if great comedy acting is, is great dramatic acting. It's, it's just 99.99% how it is in life with 0.001% commentary. 
That's mm-hmm. how I always felt about Phil. Just a little, like the dead eyes is an example of just a little bit of exaggeration. Yes. That's the, the, the finer, the comedy acting, you know what I mean? Is how small the exaggeration can be. It makes it so funny too. Cause if you're in an absurd sketch, like I was doing church chat with him, I'm in the dress and everything. He comes out yeah. of Saddam Hussein and uh, he's playing it like it's drama. I mean, it's there's no winking, no nodding, no, no, it's just flat, real, and and intimidating and scary, and so that just makes the whole sketch lifts up the sketch to have someone play that. And in Axe Murderer, I didn't have a blow to his little speech of you know uh, he scooped at his eyes and pissed in his ocular cavities, uh-huh. and I didn't have a blow to it. You know what I mean? And then Phil on camera <laughs> during the take goes this way to the cafeteria. <laughs> right after that, yeah, yeah, right after the movie, yeah, just, yeah. off putting. Yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. I think when when you're a newer comic or a new uh, comic actor, a, a, an easy way to do is go. You take the lines and you put a big spin on them, put a lot of English to make it funny in quotes. And the more you are in it and you watch people when they do the microscopically tiniest things, that's the most fun after a while to see. And, I think he was so perfect at that. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super small, super controlled, super tasteful. Um, and he was also super nice to me. I mean, that's the other thing too, you know? Yeah. Cause like, you came in, we, Phil and I came in and you were there like maybe a season later, a season and a half later. Right. And you were welcomed in, in different ways by different cast members. But Phil, yes. I'm sure was, cause you know, everybody, <laughs> the new kid is a new kid in town, whatever that Eagle song well, is. You were fantastic. You took me under your wing. You told me, you basically gave me the relative real estate of, of uh, this is where you want to be home base. This is where you know what I mean? And Phil, the same Phil was um, very generous. Conan was super generous. Yeah. It, it seemed absurd to me to be upset with the person who's getting their break like they didn't mm. plan it you could if he needed to wanted to be upset just talk to lauren or something but you yeah. were just someone who crushed all the way through your early acting second city and then martin short said hey there is this guy and then you got on the show and pretty quickly by the end of the first season you had a bunch of hits i mean a bunch of big big sketches Wow, well, thanks. You know, and that was a lot of like the crew were very supportive and you were insanely supportive and um, Phil. And so, you know, I got to know, I got to know Phil also too. He was, he didn't, he, he, towards the end when I was there, he didn't write so much. Mm-hmm. And mm. I was always struggling for material. I was like, I'm dry, I'm dry, I'm dry. And like I, I've said this a lot of times, but then I'd go into his room and he was doing a different hobby, you know? Right. So one who <laughs> so, was looking at yachts. He goes, building a model or something. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then it was diamonds and he had like a jeweler's loop and he goes, the three C's or whatever it is, cut. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Right? And then the last time Carrots. I saw him, he was putting a ship in a bottle. Oh, funny. <laughs> he was like, Jesus. just hold on, Mike. And it was the last thing of pulling the mast up. And he had these long yeah. scissors <laughs> and he's tying it up. And I go, how do you have such time? I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm yeah. pulling my hair out. I think I'm being fired. I've got no material. And then at read through, because he's such a great comedy actor, he had a stack of yeah. stack of scenes that he was in. And I had the three that I had written. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> And people put him in 42 of the 44 sketches. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so he's always got something to do. Through, and I was like, I got all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, God, was he a, a, a hobbyist, uh, scuba, yeah. di- scuba diving, uh, sailboat, and this just- Tropical th- Islands, that was the other one. Mike, you ever think about buying a tropical island? <laughs> no, nope. I can t- I can safely say I've never thought about buying a tropical island. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everyone's sweating over their over their yellow notepad writing. When I walk by his, he's like, "Spade, come in, sit down." Yeah, yeah. hey, <laughs> and like everything's relaxed. I'm like, "Sorry, I'm freaking out." The show's in two days. Yeah, and I got nothing. I'm for you know. The one character he yeah. did, I think he did in his audition, but he really like could look like John Wayne. He had just a, a kind of. Yeah. He had like he had a handsome man face, and he could yes. leverage it when he wanted to. When he played, um, I don't know, Hans and Franz, he played a sad sack. Uh, can't, can't remember. 
brilliantly. But when mm. he wanted to be the handsome guy, he could really go for that. And his John Wayne was he really looked like he just looked like it was him. Charlton Heston. Oh, it's he just, Heston. Yeah. There's he just no thought one thought he was Charlton Heston, yeah. you know. Just the chin up and the wide mouth and kind of gapping for air. Well, yeah, we, I can't I do it, but it was so no. perfect. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, him as Ed McMahon is a great memory too. Just just and this German guy with the fake uh Sid Caesar German, you know, the Yeah. And, but then he'd do John Wayne German, which is Ick have a flunk in my depth perception exam. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he'd be like, that's two things that you can't just pull you, out of your bag like that. I know. Yeah. It's a, it's amazing how effortless it was for him, or it seemed to be. But he, he Well, he was a hard worker too. I mean, that's he prepared. He, literally, yeah. he did. He sure. always came to be sure. the first one of the read through table. Mm -hmm. And uh he would make his little notes, you know, and I, I had the the joy of sitting next to him and I, and I, I had the option of moving closer to the host as I was there longer, but I just, I, I stayed right next to Phil cause I learned almost everything about cold reading and about preparing. I never had nearly what he had to prepare, but um, you know, I just, he was so generous to me. And so, um, it was all about the work for Phil, you know what I mean? And then when it wasn't about the work, he literally had no time for show business whatsoever. It was literally <laughs> like hobbies and Mike, have you been on a catamaran? It was always like a new exotic thing. Mike, have you ever made a bean bag? Yes. <laughs> no, I really, I, have I really you have. parasailed, Mike? <laughs> uh, no, I can't think. Have yeah, you ever was... worn the skin of a dead person to get into the <laughs> other realm and understand what's happening on the other side? No. Were you there, Mike? Were you there for Reagan Mastermind? No. Do you know that, that one, Dana? That was the first season. Yeah, I was in it as Jimmy Stewart. That was like Reagan being the bumbling, doddering, sweet old man. And then the, the guest leaves, and then there's a switch, and then he's this brilliant. He's speaking foreign yeah. languages. It was yeah. He closed the door. And he's the smartest guy for, in the world for uh, Phil. That was her. That was the first season. Yeah. Unfrozen caveman lawyer is is a prime example of like. You know, so his caveman <laughs> takes no nods whatsoever to grunting and, mm -hmm. you know, me like fire, you know, whatever. Yeah, speaks He's perfectly. Articulate, bourgeois, you know what I mean? He's, <laughs> He's a, a lawyer. lawyer. Some yeah. of those lines are like, you know, I'm a caveman. You know, he goes back to that. And then he I'm goes, a simple but I, caveman. <laughs> I'm a simple, I was chipped out of the ice. And then he goes, but I do feel my clients deserve 20 million in punitive damages and also another 5 million for the. <laughs> he goes right back into being Your a lawyer. planes frighten me. These are Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Candy, but the writer, if, was, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if you don't, you know, sh sh shovel the snow off the front of your porch, you know, law 25.B right. states, you know, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Just playing with that. That was, you know, pretty stout makeup for SNL, a complete prosthetic. Yeah. And he played it, oh, yeah. obviously, flat real. Again, played it dramatically, actually. And also, you felt a lot of empathy for the character. It, 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 the more people are around and think about that sketch, it's kind of become shinier and brighter. You know, yeah. there hasn't been anything and, quite like it, you know. Well, and then there was a series of, uh, of course, somebody has a, can you hear the plane? Mm -mm. Somebody nope. next to me has a, uh, what do you call it? Oh, a drone. A cox jet. Oh. oh, a drone? Um, <laughs> okay. The uh, Can you hear it? You must be able to hear it. I don't. Do you hear it, oh, okay. David? Yeah. Yes. Kim Jong-un is his neighbor. He has a lot of toys. He must be. He's lighting <laughs> up his rockets. I pissed off the wrong man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, Phil's, the breadth of his work, the, the, the variety of things that he could do. Mm-hmm. Um, he was just, you know, it, it is damning him with faint praise and not correct to say he was a utility player. Mm -hmm. Um, he was the most versatile comedy performer I've ever seen. And, um, yeah. I put, like I said, I put his versatility up there with, uh, Peter Sellers and, and, uh, God, Christopher Guest, uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I could. You know, Dan Aykroyd, that, yeah. that family of uh, detailed, controlled, restrained, but sharp as attack performers. 
Yeah. You could go up to him and before read through and say, can you do a Russian accent? He's like, what part of Russia? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know there was more than that. <laughs> what I'm doing is more Rostov Street. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's nice. Good Lord. And uh, he could I be explosive them. too for, yeah. you know, somewhat reserved, uh, you know, uh, a scientist really off stage in many ways or just an explorer of life. But when he wanted to do a character that just went out, when he needed that gear, he could do that too, which was well, just how about taking part. over in the Sinatra group, how he just would take yeah, exactly. over. Exactly. It's yeah. either one day's Eggman. <clears throat> Bless you. I think somebody's cutting grass out there. Um, one day he's Eggman. And the other day he's Walrus. explosive oh. as, uh, in the Sinatra group. Yeah. Yeah. He ran that whole sketch. And then uh, that, that uh, you immediately after the Sinatra group, you're like, oh, well, that's going to be one for the best of. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I felt that way about the McLaughlin group too, which is brilliant. Yeah. The first one. And then it accelerated with uh, putting Frank Sinatra was, and there was this inspired and then having Phil play Frank Sinatra and Jan playing Sinead O'Connor. Sinead, of course. Yeah. I guess we all yeah. owe Sinead an apology. Like, yeah. I think yeah. that's one thing to, you know, I don't know. You, they were a bit of a duo, uh, in those first five years, Jan and Phil did a lot of things together because it was male, female stuff. It was restaurant dating. It was game show host for Phil or father. So right, just sure. giving some uh, sugar to the great Jan hooks, right? Jan, now what a home run hitter. She was another, Oof. those two together. So in my very first sketch in the cold opening game show, psychic, he fills a game show host and Jan was this <laughs> kind of doddering character, Midwestern person. So, yeah, can you imagine, like, you're with those two pros <laughs> in your very no. first sketch? So it was like, oh, this is really <laughs> cooking. Everybody's on point, you know? And that's what I felt like for the first two years. I felt like I'd, I'd be brought into an all-star cast. And, um, you know, I felt like a, somebody who played for Saskatoon all of a sudden playing for New York Rangers. You know? <laughs> yeah, but truth somebody be told... Which of you, course is you made you were reference. like the the star, well, basketball or whatever, the star, yes. you know, it's an all star thing. Universal and not yeah, and you, Canadian like I you just had. Did. You were, had that European influence, and you had your stuff was really fresh. It really brought a whole new vibe to the show, and it you melded completely with all of us. I thought, you know. Uh, Lothar of the Hill People, Sprockets. <laughs> I get, Lothar. Lothar, were they Hill People? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, know middle-aged men. <laughs> I think I may have mentioned Lothar. I got nothing from anybody on the street for Lothar ever, <laughs> except the people, nothing ever. Except Hill People? Except for the people that worked in Central Park. So Really? I, we oh, go wow. for a walk on Sunday after the show on Saturday through Central Park, and it'd be, oh, my God, it's Lothar. And I thought I was love that. I love Lothar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like, am I being punked right now? Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Uh, thank you. And for people yeah. who want to look it up, Lothar was a... A Middle Earthian person. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was the character I would do when I played Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. And now my mm -hmm. kid is thoroughly into Dungeons and Dragons. It, does he do no. Lothar as he plays it? <laughs> no, they don't. They don't do voices. Which I was like, well, why? Why do Dungeons and Dragons if you're not going to have to act? Do a character. character. Mm. Yeah, but Lothar but, was. I he was trying to understand uh, modern psychology centuries ago, and he would do it in a rudimentary kind of language yes. about men and women's relationships. Yes, exactly. I always found it very funny. <laughs> Thank you. I do not know what this woman. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. yeah, I don't know not what goes on. Yeah. <laughs> Which I always love, like whenever I eat barbecue, anything that has bones, I always go, "Come, let us talk of the hunt." Yeah, that's you know? yeah, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I remember that. The gazelle is a noble creature. Yeah, he gave it the tough up for us. They must have talked like that in 15th yes. century, wherever. Haltingly, without contractions. <laughs> yeah. He gave yeah, himself up for us. <laughs> Very <laughs> articulate. Oh boy. Well, um, you've well, given us so much else about Phil. I mean, I don't than, know. I think you've we've covered. I, I love them, and um, yeah. we love them. Really, we miss them. We miss them. I saw him as a as a hero and a mentor and a, a very good friend. And 
very, he raised the bar for everybody of mm-hmm. what was possible. And uh, yeah, I, I would have loved to see what he'd be working on now, you know? I sometimes think when live streaming came in, especially the amount of work he would have gotten if he wanted to take it because yeah. because of his range. You could yeah. have put him in any of these shows. Plug and he play. He would have worked yeah. nonstop. Yeah, nonstop. nonstop if he chose to. He, he could be in the crown. You know, of course, you could too if you but, wanted to. But, um, but I, I feel that he could have also directed because he, yeah. he had such a... Um, well, he's an artist. I mean, yeah, he had a such visual a artist. Yeah. And because he came from drawing as well, mm-hmm. you know, he thought in pictures, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is, you know, that's one of my favorite, you know, people always, you know, who was a big influence on, on me. And I always go, you know, Buster Keaton as much as Chaplin, as much as Peter Sellers, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I love picture comedy too, you know what I mean? And so did Phil. And you Absolutely. can see it in Pee Wee's Big Adventure as well. Which, which Phil, Phil, Phil Cole around. wrote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is always magical when you, well, especially when there was no sound with Buster Keaton, but when there is sound, but but a scene chooses just to go to a maybe the some music or whatever, and then everything yeah. plays out non-verbally. It's uh, never uh, underestimate that as it's, a cinematic. It's shown and tour. not told, you know. And yeah. that was a great quote that Lauren Michaels always had, which is you always want the movie... Uh, to still work as a story and as a comedy, even if you didn't buy the headset on the plane mm-hmm. and you're looking over somebody's shoulder to what they're watching. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, my phrase for it was funny with the sound off. You know? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think um, Phil would have been a great director, you know, mm-hmm. of, of comedy. Oh yeah. I, I think. We most... were just watching. You know, we, we, uh, the whole family, uh, one of the great things of having three kids under the age of 12 is I'm able to show them movies that my wife Kelly and I love. And we oh, that's them so much Club. fun. You showed them Breakfast, Breakfast Club. Okay. We just saw Breakfast Club on Saturday. Molly the, Ringwald, I, Judd, is that? Uh, Judd Emilio. Nelson, yeah. Uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Yes. Ali Sheedy, yes. And Ali Sheedy. It's spectacular but so the framing well you know you know she steals stuff mm-hmm. and it's just how they had a locked off frame and then she just sort of entered in the back and stole something like just to know good framing you know what i mean but not know it then when you're watching and then now you look at it with different eyes and you go and then you go this was designed this wasn't that was smart accident. yeah this is somebody who knew that there was an extra laugh in there just in how it was shot and i think phil had that kind of brain you know what i mean yeah you see it in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which is a masterpiece of comedy staging. You know how mm-hmm. when Pee Wee is the the guy in the you know uh, Paul Rubens is the playing himself as a mm-hmm. he's the bellboy and yes, he's in the Beijing Mister Herman. Yes, yes, and and generally kind of keeping it wider and moving masters and letting stuff happen in yeah. the frame. A lot of what they called um, uh, Fred Astaire's Fred Astaire shots. Yeah. Yeah, head to toe and just follow it. And let let Fred dance, right? You know yeah, I mean? let and it all what, happen in his rhythm. Yeah. And Kubrick did a lot of that with Peter Sellers. The supposedly Kubrick got a ferny pad and went to the base of the camera and would mm-hmm. just uh, lie on it and just kind of let Peter Sellers do his thing. And all, his job was to make sure that he had some kind of coverage. And, yeah, uh, Kubrick. He sat there with a big smile on his face, you know. I watched, you know, sometimes at night you go to sleep. So it's like, okay, YouTube can't, comes up and it's mm. the the scene from uh, Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. Where Peter Sellers, almost better than Dr. Strangelove, is his vacuous, almost uh, effeminate president. Yeah, Merkin. Yeah. Valdemir, and then George C. Scott, who apparently mm. um, Kubrick said, gave him carte blanche. Okay, go way too big because he was, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then it ended up, you know, being you know, just startlingly brilliant to watch that. And, and I think Phil, Phil could have done the president uh, or part. that. Yeah. yeah. Phil could have totally, he could have played five parts in something. Mm-hmm. Each of them brilliant. You know yeah. I mean? Yeah. Good Lord. Good Lord. Oh, well. <laughs> you know who else did drawings? <laughs> Simon. 
here we are still loving him. So yeah, Simon um, likes drawings. Phil could have done Simon. Yeah. He could have done church lady. Done- <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's but yeah, we were just so lucky to all find each other at that time in our lives. And uh, there was a lot of great chemistry. And uh, during those years with Phil as sort of, uh, again, we'll probably bring this up a lot, nicknamed the glue. Um, it was the glue. Glue. They're not glue. saying boo. They're saying glue. They're saying glue. <laughs> That's what the announcer says yeah. in the arena. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, who are you, you going to call? Phil Hartman, if you need that, that, and that. But uh, yeah. he meshed beautifully with us uh, in different ways, you and I, and, and yeah. Kevin Nealon. And, Kevin's uh, brilliant as yeah. well. So we had a lot of... Uh, we were all I just a little that, bit different. Yeah. I always say that Kevin was the George Harrison of our cast. <laughs> he didn't write that. He didn't write a ton of songs, but mm-hmm. the songs he did do were, you know, Here Comes the Sun and yeah. uh, something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The sketches he did write were just awesome. So, I, well, I the, the one that someone is going to be on this show uh, 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 honoring Phil Hartman and his brilliance, I mentioned. Um, Kevin Nealon's waiter without a pad that I think yeah. went to dress. We'll oh, talk Phil about was it. In that. Yeah. yeah. Waiter without a pad, but I don't know if it went to air, but it was one it of those did. things. Oh, it did. Okay. It did. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's one of my, I, that's I a, love it. Waiter without a pad is, is a, is a, I use it in my life when I'm trying to explain it's to somebody, so please, you gotta write funny. this down, dude. Please <laughs> write it write down. down. Yeah. And Phil down. kept going, uh, down down, you know? Yeah. Guy, please come on. He's like, okay, spaghetti for the lady and a cream de cassis. He's like, hey, fella, uh, that's not even close to what we ordered. If you could just maybe grab a pen and and he goes, no, 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 I got it. And he goes, it's a, and he goes, sis, 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 sis. <laughs> Kevin's yeah. trying to guess what they're doing. so good. <laughs> this next young man went to the same community college as I did, Bill Hader um, in Scottsdale. And he was a big admirer of Phil, along with many others. And I don't think he ever got to meet Phil, but he had a lot to say about him. I have to apologize to Bill because, Bill, when I saw you, uh, you don't remember, I saw you at this dinner the other night. I remember. (laughs) You would never remember. I was at the dinner. I was sitting a couple down for you. But um, (laughs) anyway, I... I had, I had hurt my hand a couple of days before. And so I went to shake hands and I forgot. And so when I shook hands with people, I go like this oh, and it, no. it hurt every time. Oh, and no. Bill was really nice. Cause I think he could sense my weakness just for in the air. So he didn't totally crunch me with his strong hand <laughs> because I felt so weird not shaking hands and I knew it was going to hurt. So I'd go, Hey, and then I go, Arr! cause it's hard to give that lefty one. It looks a little weird. <laughs> lefty so, fist bump. Lefty I know it turned into okay. fist bump. But everyone gets a little jarred. So, and then here <laughs> comes Mulaney, that motherfucker. He saw me weak and he came in, he crunched all the bones as hard as he could. And he didn't know what he was doing. But of course, he, he gave me that Kung Fu grip. And then, and that's when I went to the doctor the next day and I go, something's definitely wrong. And then he, he x-rayed it and he goes, yeah, you broke, you have a broken bone oh in your hand. That's God. why it hurts so much. Oh, oh you so broke a go. bone? You broke a bone? I don't know From if Bill broke bro- it. From Mulaney broke your Mulaney hand? Broke. That's the clickbait story, <laughs> but it, I think it was broken when I got there. Well, I remember that Bill used to call him Baby Hercules as like a yeah. little side reference, you know. Yeah. And so I guess he has superhuman grip strength. He you doesn't never know, even that know that it. about John. Yeah, He's really strong. Comes off like a square ball. I remember about that dinner was showing up, and it was a birthday dinner that John was having, and we, me and Dave, looked at each other, and we both were like we saw there was like 20 people there and we both had the same thought, which was like, are we paying for this? Like, like who's paying for this? Because <laughs> John had a birthday for himself. <laughs> and you're like, and of course you can't was, pay for your own dinner. Like, do we, I don't hey, think. We can't let him pay for his own dinner, but this yeah. is really nice. There's a lot of people here. Like, are we all pitching in? And then, and then of course, Nick Kroll was the one who was like, I'll ask him, John, we're not paying for this, right? <laughs> <laughs> John's like, I'll pay for it. Don't worry. Yeah, before he did that, I saw Sarah Silverman scooping extra potatoes. I go, relax over there until we figure this out. <laughs> Comedians are starving artists. I'm surprised Lauren didn't pick it up. I know. Oh, yeah, Lauren. Bill, I, and we'll get to this in a second. I thought the Lauren name tag was a joke. I thought it was like, oh, look, it's Lauren. He's not here, but we used to always save a place for him. And then Lauren Michaels showed up. And we were all like, I got it. It was like, Warden. 
<laughs> All the inmates straighten up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, everyone got quiet for a little bit, right? I yeah, feel everybody like. did get quiet, and it was, you know, what are we? Is there part of us that is still trying to impress Lauren? On <laughs> are we still kind of yeah, want him? I'm sure, you we were funnier than David. David was funnier than Marin. Yeah, and yeah, well, he it was a thing where. You go over and sit with him, and it is like I picked up the con- last conversation I had, you know, five years, you know, two years. Ago. <laughs> it's like I sit down, he's like, and Charlie Chaplin's house in Sweden is there. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, and I don't think your update it 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 it, it played, but it didn't laugh. <laughs> it got air but it didn't stick it he's, he's the best summer upper of of activities yeah, ever God. just gets it down to five or six words did he have anything post Barry you'll, you'll go that Kubrick route you go the Kubrick you'll- now he never mentions that he's usually very sweet he's just like how are your kids how was that yeah. mm-hmm. you know, everything okay mm-hmm. I saw him scribbling and it said uh, Pat and Oswald two quips and he circled them <laughs> <laughs> he said fucking okay, Nick Kroll's blanking and then I put glad I didn't hire him. This dinner proved it. I made the right call. Yeah, Nick Kroll no, audition he, he, question mark. Did he audition? <laughs> yeah. This is his second audition and it's going just as well. Yeah. The damn man is very sweet, very quiet. I did he was uh, seated next to Lauren and I just saw him turn to Lauren and he was trying to think of something to say. And he picked up his name tag, and I heard him just say, uh, I believe we get to take these home. <laughs> that was his <laughs> thing. So <laughs> I felt so bad for the guy. Uh, who oh. was that? I didn't get that. Yeah, who was yeah, that? Dan, man, he's very funny. He's a voice on uh, Bob's Burgers. Uh, really mm-hmm. funny. He's a, he's a pickle. He's a pickle. I thought it would have been five <laughs> people figures. at Koi. Five people at Koi. That's yeah, what I thought it was. Five people at Koi would have been great. Perfect. Yeah, you know, but Lauren was fine. But yeah, I think initially I was like, wait, he's actually coming. And he came in and it was great. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. He is always fun. And he brought his kid. Yeah. And Eddie, who's the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. He was mm-hmm. really smart guy. I like Eddie. I was diametrically the furthest person from Lauren. <laughs> yeah. So there's really nothing I could do except trudge down there. There's no chair next to him. So I got to lean over. Hey, Lauren. Did anyone yeah. do bits about the name tag? He goes, mm, one guy did. Yeah. And I go, mm, okay. Well, then I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, it's like the table read. I was, I don't know where you guys sat at the table read, but where I was at the table read was where you were at. It's like you were right across from him. Oh. So when you were doing your sketch and it was dying, <laughs> you could see him out of focus beyond losing patience or sad dad looking sad or looking over his glasses like <laughs> out of your fucking mind you know or, why why are you putting me through and this? he bails on the exposition oh yeah that's the worst so then... <laughs> and he leaves the room with a tear in his eye all right yeah. Onto the uh, Fox okay. News bumper. walks <laughs> Bill, <laughs> and you're like, "Well, shit, wait, where am I?" <laughs> wait, did you do this thing called Mister Poopy, Dana? What did you tell me? About? Funny little poopy head. Just funny so Lauren poopy. would have to say that exposite. He had to say funny little poopy head literally twenty times. <laughs> funny little poopy head sits down. A oh, funny little poopy head is sad. Funny little poopy head. <laughs> sad. <laughs> funny little poopy head. I had that catchphrase. Uh, I got to, got to, got to go. And Jan, the great Jan Hooks was um, fun, Mrs. Funny Little Poopy Head. And I'm going with him. And Lauren, I don't know if he ever know. Maybe he'll know now if he hears this. I'm mm-hmm. trying to pull a fast one on me. Did, did you ever do a gag one? Did you ever do one just for fun and read through, Bill, where you knew it was just to, oh. just to, Make no, things I think silly. I just, I, it was always just fun when you know you would get uh you know there was just you would turn the page and it was just tons of dialogue we would all just kind of start i would just start laughing because i could feel lauren's impatience and right but he really plows ahead he doesn't skip around especially if someone brought in a film piece that was a former writer like smigel or someone writing a thing or you know and it would be like a big mm-hmm. tape that was mostly like visual 
you know, just hearing him do that. But me and Kenan Thompson used to do that. It was always Lauren like in a shower and he couldn't get out and the shower was filling up with water and he starts to drown. But <laughs> it was him in that voice being like, you know, starting the shower and he's washing himself. And, he's like, <laughs> and then looks down and goes like, rrr, 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 rrr. and then like the water is racing. <laughs> drown. And then one was him with a hang glider on a hang glider talking like that. But like, that was our impression of Warren. It wasn't like him speaking words. It was his read through voice his read through and it was just gibberish that's hysterical yeah i do like when he gets excited after a bomb what you just did where a sketch bombs and then it's a pause and people are turning their pages and he goes uh hanukkah song and we go to add update desk adam sandler with a guitar <laughs> trying to get the energy back yeah he gets it back yeah. he goes maybe this one will work <laughs> Yeah. Did you guys ever have a host say, uh, uh, what is this? I'm not into this. <laughs> Elton John in the middle? Said, in the middle, Elton John. Uh, and I don't, he was like, I'm not doing this. He just said, no. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Like, oh, no. Like, don't worry. <laughs> 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 like, I, 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 I can't do this. I can't do this. Uh, these people are friends. You know, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, 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 Phil, you know, is just sort of, well, he was very low key individual, whatever, but his record on that show was so brilliant and people like to talk about it. So, yeah, I was, he was definitely when I got the show and, you know, you, 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 you look at, you know, you know, it is kind of like an A team thing. And especially when I came in, I was, we had a huge cast. And so it was kind of like where, you know, it's the A team, like, uh, what do we not have here? Do we not have like a dynamite person, <laughs> you know, or a guy who can, you know, uh, build a, a bridge? Or, I don't know. It's like you needed like your own special yeah. thing. Yeah, your shortstop, your catcher. Yeah, exactly. Which, what are you going to play? What am I going to play? You're the dad? What, are you the game show host? Are you and, then I, and then, yeah, and then you sit and you look at Phil Hartman and I just thought, well, I could, you know, I've always really had a, a I was always just very much attracted to his kind of that he could do it all, you know, that he really could do the game show host. And he was so committed as the game show host. He wasn't trying. There, there was no, um, no winking or anything. It was all so committed, you know? And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh, the reason this other stuff is so funny is because he's so committed to being straight. And that makes everybody funny. You know what I mean? So he, I always just appreciated that about him. And it was like, oh, I could, if I do that, then I'll maybe, maybe I'll be that guy, you know, just whatever you put me in, I'll just commit like that the way Hartman did. Yeah. You know, even in Motivational Speaker, which is like the most bananas character, he plays the dad and he reacts. He, he's the only one not laughing. He's yeah. the only one just staring straight ahead, going, you know, we hired a motivational speaker. He's been down in the basement eating coffee beans for the last three hours. Yeah. <laughs> this, well, this is so always, straight. Yeah. He's like, we've always encouraged uh, our uh, to ride. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That one, so yeah. We've always encouraged him to ride. You know, like. Do, doesn't notice the craziness around him. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't work if he's, you know, he's the base, you know. Yeah. He's like. But then when he was funny, then when you see something like. Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer was the one that kind of blew my mind because I was like, mm. he really and truly just does not give a shit if anybody else finds this funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt as a kid because it was so, I mean, Jack Handy wrote that, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is so uh, strange. And I found it so insanely funny, but that was my favorite kind of comedy where it was like, this is just for us. I find this funny if you're on board or you're not. And that he was so committed to it. Yeah. You know, there was no like, you know, breaking 
or anything, you know, which I was no. definitely, um, uh, you know, guilty of, but it was <laughs> like, he was just so solid, you know, you know, be able to be on shows with when I was newer and Dana was there, Dana and Phil were closer, but, uh, Phil was so nice. And then if you're in a sketch with them or something, you wouldn't dare think about breaking in front of such a pro. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, yeah. you know, that was looked down upon. You're like, don't you come in and fuck this sketch up. That's really the professionalism around there where we were like, that's why no one wanted to break because Lauren was against it. And then you knew the cast was like, no, we take this serious. We want these things to work as is yeah, or, or not. And like unfrozen was, he had a lot of dialogue and shit, but I think he loved that so much. I like that it was one of those that was so weird and a Jack Handy and it sort of crossed over to the mainstream where they liked it too. Yeah, it really was. I don't, did, was he always incredibly prepared? Yes. <laughs> How did he prepare for things? Cause he would, you, Dana, you too, you guys had a lot of heavy lifting. I go, I would sit and watch the SNL when I was there, we got the server. Where we could go back and watch old sketches Oh, whoa. And we could watch old dress rehearsals and things like that. Wow. And so I would cool. sit yeah. and go through all that stuff. And I would go, God, Dana and No oh, Hartman had so much heavy lifting in those shows, man, especially the cold opens and everything. And I'm just like, what was the preparation like for that? Well, so Phil was very meticulous. He had a beautiful binder. He would be in a lot of sketches because he was so versatile and great. And so, and he was always super prepared. And I think that a theme that's come up is that he was just a great actor and he would play that baseline and play it so real, whether it's anger or whatever. Um, I just want to say one thing personally about unfrozen caveman lawyer. When I was on the soundstage, when that started and I remember thinking to myself, this is so funny. I'm kind of numb. I can't laugh now, but I'll laugh later. <laughs> because just the whole idea of it and Phil being so serious, you know, some things are so funny. You just go, you go quiet. I can't, this is well, you're too taking funny. it all in. You're like, wow, what is this thing? Is this what I think it is? Are they really doing this? Yeah. And we, your ways uh, confuse me and yeah. me. I am, but a simple caveman. Yeah. The way that this caveman was using it, the caveman to curry favor from a jury, <laughs> but that he was full of shit because I want to, jump out of my BMW and run out <laughs> wood, whatever. Like, what is this? Oh, yeah, I like her. He goes, or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes uh, at, toward the end of the sketch, he goes, cause again, I'm a caveman in the world. Friends and confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> just, just talking down to the jury. <laughs> yeah. God damn. Are they, there monsters in my house? I don't know. <laughs> what I do know. <laughs> yeah. That one, my 20 million, yeah, <laughs> in punitive damages. <laughs> he knows those words. Did Bill <laughs> was Jack Handy ever sending in sketches when you were there? Did you, no, but loved he him was kind of was. a Jack Handy was a um, you know, a legend obviously for deep thoughts and everything, but uh, he was the guy that like when Downey or or um, Al Franken or someone would come to the show, they would say, oh, God, dude, J Jack Handy did this sketch. The, the one they always talked about was Giant Businessman. They were talking about where, where <laughs> Phil was a giant. <laughs> Remember this? That <laughs> sounds familiar. And he's, in, he's inside a house. That's a Jack Handy sketch. And he's in, so he's in like a little dollhouse, like in an apartment. And people next door, are, it's like a punk band or something. They're playing. And he mm -hmm. goes down the hallway and he's huge and he knocks on the, the door with his finger and he's like, excuse me, could you keep your, the noise down? And it's, you know, punk guy, whoever it was. And it was like, no, and if you knock on a door again, I'll kick your ass. And then he goes back to his apartment and he picks up a tiny telephone and he goes, action program. And that was the sketch. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> So him being a giant and being a businessman had nothing to do with any. Of yeah, that's that's and like Downey and yeah, that was like like Al Frank and Downey would be like, oh my god, he would do these things that were just like we never thought that you could do that. You know. Oh, how about this? This guy, this writer Matt Piedmont, just out of the blue, he's texting me yesterday, and he just says, uh, because he listened to the podcast, and he goes. Hey, have you done Jack Handy yet? And I said, no, we're trying to find him in the woods or wherever. And he goes, 
Do you remember Harvey Keitel's show when he did An Insane Idiot and his collection of descending sized deer heads? One of the greatest sketches ever, d- deer heads. I think about <laughs> yes. it once a month. And really, yeah. <laughs> Keitel. Yeah, deer heads is one of the best sketches of all. <laughs> <laughs> and he sent a clip from it. I'm like, oh yes. Or he's like, this is, I shot this deer. This isn't a deer. Yeah, it was like a deer, then like a smaller deer. And it's him with like a tumbler of scotch. Mm-hmm. And he's like, here's a deer I killed. And here's a smaller deer. Here's another deer I killed. It's not as big as that deer. And then here's, and then <laughs> it gets to the point where it's like, this teensy. is the, this is a, <laughs> a, like a, a hamster that cut its head off when I put antlers on its head. <laughs> Cut its head off. <laughs> and this is this is a toy deer that I just cut the head off. And then the ending is like a microscope. And of course, Downey's favorite line sketch was he goes, Now can you can you get your camera in there? <laughs> and they bring the camera. You see that little and it's like a petri dish, and it's like you see the little dot over in the corner? That's a deer, and I think with the right technology I could cut its head off. <laughs> 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 and he goes, well, I need to freshen up. And he goes over to the bar and then, yeah, big crumbly Ben Hur letters and Pardo's voice. This has been an insane idiot and in his descending collection of deer heads. This has been <laughs> an insane idiot. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at that after we uh, finish this fight. Yeah. That whole Harvey Keitel episode is pretty amazing. It's like very funny. It's like, That's the uh, Kevin Nealon is the uh, bathroom attendant. Is that that one? I think that. And then there's the one where there's subway announcers and they're just like. God damn. Great New York dramatic actors can kick ass on that show. Yeah. Man. Yeah, for, but yeah, but Hart, Hartman was always, Phil Hartman was always the guy that I just I don't know I was just always so, um, I, yeah, just like kind of talking about just that prof- the professionalism and the the ease in which he did everything. He just seemed so confident, you know, and so yes. kind of like it was okay to be, you know, those thankless parts where you're you're the game show host, which I played a ton of those, where you're having to kind of you're facilitating everybody Mm -hmm. and your, your rhythm is kind of driving the sketch. Like if you're slowing down, then everything is going to start to slow down. So you have to kind of Mm -hmm. keep it at a certain pace and it's hard and you're facilitating everybody else that that can be fun, you know, and that you can actually make that funny by having like the right attitude and still service it. You know what I mean? It just taught me, it was like, Oh, that's how a sketch is supposed to, work it can't everybody can't be at a 10 you know Mm -hmm. everybody can't be insane you know and then once after and then the thing is like as people get to know you then like i would have writers like john mulaney and simon rich and america sawyer and these people start writing for me the game show host but he had like a weird personality you know but Mm -hmm. you couldn't do that out of the gate i I, lauren would tell me that he's like they got to get to know you first Mm mm-hmm and then know it's something different. Then you can yeah. start messing with the thing, but you gotta like come in in a way where they they like you and they come to you, and then you can start messing with it. And I feel like Phil Hartman kind of did that because to me he was always, you know, the the straight guy. And then so that's why when like Unfrozen came in, lawyer or annually retentive chef, chef, or chef. you know, or uh, when he played Peter Graves. You know, and he goes, oh, right? You know, that stuff. Like, that, mm-hmm. was, that was unbelievable. Played Andy Griffith, we found out yesterday. I, for, I forgot about Andy Griffith. Maybe Matlock. During his Ritz Cracker phase or something. <laughs> you know, that's what, what Smigel said. <laughs> his Ritz Cracker. Like, mmm, yum and good. I don't know what it was. Uh, but good when cracker. he played Matlock, is that what he was like? Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know Diddly Squad about Lauren. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that <laughs> I don't know what it's like to catch a. Catfish down at Crackerberry Creek. <laughs> 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 Shit. <laughs> you know, SNL, there were people, last thought, so the, the office was insane. Like Smigel's office, the amount of chaos. And then Phil's office was meticulous with different stations of uh, fly color fishing coding. equipment, color coding, like oil painting. And- 
and he liked everything. He's an amazing painter too. Yeah, he was like uh, did all these albums, yeah. Poco, and uh, he uh, he was a pilot. He had boats. He had he had scuba diving equipment. I mean, he was completely. He's a blues player. You know, he was an album fisherman. So all that stuff, like the comedy, was just one aspect of it. And was he? Cause I remember Tom Hanks telling me that he remembered uh, Phil at table reads and like under the table would have like a fly fishing uh, magazine. Yes. <laughs> it's so be, easy for like him. Looking down. So non-stressed about being in 80 sketches. Yeah. That's wild. He calmed me down. I mean, I would come out to 8H with nerves. And when I saw Phil in his costume, you know, finally we're going for this. It would definitely be a, a calming effect. Was, like, was he, you ever see him get nervous or was he always just, Cool as a cucumber. I never, never saw him. I never saw him. Uh, got nervous. Yeah, I'm a, um, like you. I was like you, like, which is very well, you know. But but I was more like like I was very nervous, and you'd see those people. Mm -hmm. For me, it was always like Amy Poehler or uh, Fred Pat Armisen could literally mm -hmm. be sitting there having a chat with somebody, and then go, "Oh, hold on," and then do killing a sketch, and then go right back and go, "Yes, anyway, what I was saying," and you know. Like, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> losing my mind. Was Phil, uh, did, was he like ever, um, how was he, I don't know if you can use this in the show, but I'm just curious. How was he with a weak host? Like if the host Ooh. was going to bring it, was he, would he, would he. Wow, that's a great question. Do you know what I mean? Or what was, you know what I mean? You know, like, I don't want to name names, but I remember you have a host and it's like not working. You you can get frustrated and pull back or you can go, all right, we got to like. Yeah. I yeah. don't think that was in Phil's. Phil was a, just an immensely likable person and generous. I don't think that we would have that gear. I think yeah. I would see him just wanting to give the host confidence during right. rehearsal yeah. and yeah. that's great. And you know, the other person, don't worry if you drop a line and you know, I, I think that's the way I would see him not getting frustrated yeah. Because his 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 interests were so vast. And he also was doing his star Saturday Night Live. <laughs> but yeah. he was a fisherman and a pilot. And yeah. I mean we would we would go to Van Nuys Airport and put headphones on and just listen to the tower. Wow, really? You know? Yeah. Just listen wow. to the traffic. Cause I said I'd look, I'm too I can't go fly with you in the single engine plane. He got it, but would love it's do him. would Phil do bits? Um like yeah, if office? he in in certain situations, yeah, he would he would definitely get it. Get we once, I said this before, but we were once at dinner, you know, because Saturday Night Live weird things happen. Me and him with Neil Young and a few other people. So I said, let's make Neil Young, let's make him laugh his ass off. Let's go crazy. And Phil was doing it was it was the early nineties or something. And Phil's doing a Japanese pilot and stuff like that. You know, and just and we got we got Neil Young just helpless. So Phil would have that 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 gear sometimes and i watched yeah. his audition too i found his audition before i auditioned oh mm -hmm. at the groundlings and it was awesome i haven't seen that his audition's pretty he says i can do any accent any accent at all just tell me and they go or, and i could or i forget what it was but he says i can do uh he does uh, german he goes i can do any accent and then someone says up french and he goes i don't do french <laughs> he did that <laughs> well he'd been at groundlings 11 years and he he had turned down the show and said he didn't want to be famous and he had a pretty good life as a visual artist and doing some voiceover work he owned a house you know we just found this out he was John like a, did you feel like when you started the show and he came on he was like an a, like an adult <laughs> like, yeah you know what i mean I You're like oh shit we have an adult on the cast <laughs> Yeah. I came on with him and my very first sketch was with him and Jan Hooks. So it was a uh, right away. Was it uh, broccoli? Was it the No, it was we, we were doing a, a, game, a game show psyche. It was a game show. <laughs> and I was a psychic. So I would answer before he asked the question, you know, and Phil Oh, you know, I'd say uh red balloon. Well, let me let me get to the question first, sir. <laughs> and then a red balloon would appear. And so that was, I'd never done sketch comedy. So being with Phil and Jan, they just lifted me up because I was yeah. just crazy nervous, you know. Yeah. But Phil never, Phil was just, I don't know. Uh, there, that's He's unique in that way, his calmness. And then he could just score, play the elevator man, do whatever, yeah.
Ah. No ego, no really overt ego or competitiveness anywhere lurking in his nature. How is he when you guys showed up, like when the new uh, day, like when you and Sandler and Barley oh, guys were coming, there, was it really? Yeah, it was friendly and supportive. It was more, Dana was like an older brother and uh, Phil was like a dad. Oh, really? Like it was more fun. You know, Phil, I gave him his room because he also wasn't in the writing room, you know, like mostly I would see the Smigels and Conans and Greg Daniels, those guys around because everyone's writing all the time. So there's drifting around. Phil was like, it was a job. You'd go home, come back. He didn't stay, he didn't <laughs> stay up and write. Was Did he write I, at all? If he did write, like if he wrote Mace or maybe he helped on, um, he did write sometimes, but most of the time I didn't see him until, you know, read throughs and then at, re, uh, at a rehearsal, but he couldn't have been friendlier. He was very light, you know, and it was good to go to him because he wasn't so stressed about like we were all so tight energy. And he was like, hey, hey, fellas. <laughs> he would do that. He put that persona on sometimes for fun. Yeah. I'm sure you'll come up with something terrific, fellas. Uh, this is Phil Hoffman saying good night, you know. Oh, really? Like, but he uh, he also did all his business when, you know, we first started making a little extra money. He had it in a briefcase and he he was incorporated. He did all his taxes and stuff. It's all in here. You know, he would open it up. <laughs> he just, and he was just extremely organized and, and hardworking about, you know, memorizing things and knowing where he was going. So I, maybe that calmed him down a lot. I mean, he's probably the first guy I knew that had a house. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Dana said like that. that. It's so true. It's like, I knew guys that owned cars, but I didn't. Don't think I, any of my friends owned a house. Yeah, and he was kind of my friend. Seemed, that's that's like a rich thing that I didn't have yet. No one had that. Yeah, yeah. I. It's funny hearing that he didn't. Um, he just must have been like the perfect guy to like all you guys. But it's just like, oh, we could bring him in there. Like when you're writing, it's like, oh, we just have this this guy who it will, will can do anything and be totally fine playing yeah. the you know. The, the straight guy, the, the dad. He's and, walking by you by the piano in the writer's room at read through day. And he's breezing in. You're like, Hey, Phil, you're rushing in mine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got that one. I mean, he was, he was famous. He was a rock star according to John Lovitz. And I'm sure it's true at the groundlings, yeah. you know, um, just, just infamous, just as the guy, the go-to guy. Um, but, just a generous, nice person, you know, yeah. just a sweet, sweet person. That's all I heard from everybody. Yeah. He was like, when I first got there, that was, you know, he was like, you just, you go into SNL and you see all you guys' pictures up on the wall, up on 17. It's like everybody who's been on the show and you're like, Jesus Christ. It's like, that so, is weird. It's so uh, terrifying. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> it's like, and I feel like it's so perfectly put on the wall as you walk to the table read and or you work to your, oh. your offices so it's uh, mm -hmm. just so you know <laughs> constantly reminded as am i this is on your <laughs> this is the lineage you got to keep going and i'm seeing you guys and phil and you know bill murray and john Belushi, dan Aykroyd, and, yeah. and, and dan Aykroyd and laurie newman and jan jane curtain all these you know jan hooks and everybody and you're just like oh my god like, yeah. yeah, how do you do this? And so I, um, but he, yeah, man, I just think that's so cool that he, you know, was so chill. You know, I would try to, I would ask everybody. I was like, oh, well, that was like kind of the first, you know, I talked to my, talking to Mike Shoemaker and being like, oh, when did you start here? And when I do the math, I'm like, well, what was full heart? I'm like, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, Lovitz came and did a bit on your show, Dana, and I asked, you know, talked to him about him, and yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. We, we miss him and he's, he's, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And it's fun to be around someone who just loves hobbies. Is yeah, passionate. Very it's very healthy. You're never bored if you have a yeah. hobby, you know, and you'd go, go out to his boat. He had a sailboat and, and a Boston whaler motorboat and you're just driving down there with him. And then once he got on his boat, he didn't really, you didn't really interact with him. He's just looking at the tying knots Knobs. around. <laughs> and I haven't said this, but it was just sort of a weird thing. We we went on a sailboat. You know, first time I'm on a sailboat. So he's showing me how we're doing it. It's like, I don't know, maybe a 15 footer. It's just the two of us. And it was stunning, stunning day in LA. Just crystal blue skies. 
and we went around this buoy and the seals are there. And it's, it's like the Great Gatsby or something. And then we look and there's these plumes of smoke rising from L.A. What the hell is this? So we come in and it was the Rodney King verdict. Oh, was a riot. No. Oh, my God. So then we it was just one of those strange things that we shared, you know, trying oh, to get back wow. to the valley, get home, you know. But wow. anyway, yeah, I had no hobbies when he said he goes, so we got a week off coming up. Uh, what are you going to be doing? I go grinding my teeth. I don't know, <laughs> freaking the fuck out because oh, we're coming back. Fired. Yeah, I'll be crossing my fingers. I can make <laughs> ma- mouthpieces for you. I've got a little workshop in my garage. Take care Come of that on, TMG. I've got a band saw. Meow, meow. <laughs> I'm but a simple sketch player. What are you, a medium? <laughs> Nothing but a You met brought right up on this balsa wood. I forgot. Mace. Ma- Mace was the bad man, Mace. Again, right? I'm a bad, I'm a bad, 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 bad man. Bad, yeah. 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 bad, bad, half <laughs> Rotten to the core. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, well, Bill. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks for coming on. Bill Hader, nice everybody. Time, nice to see you, buddy. Thank you, guys. Next up is Sherry O'Terry, who's also an all-star groundling, and she uh, was excited to come on and talk about her admiration for the great Phil Hartman. Here she is. I'm sure people have told you that you're the one you're of, we've done like a hundred of them as far as the reaction. Yeah. Um, that's called number one. No, no, no. I did not know that till Greg said to me, you know, you were in the top three. I'm just saying for my wife and other people, when we bring up, Oh, what was your, and just, Oh, Sherry O'Terry. I mean, really? there's, oh yeah, I, I would say number one, I don't know, there's no pressure on you today. It's a little, you know, it's, you don't have to do it, but it's kind of nice to be number one. It, I mean, it's Honey, pretty- I'm blown away by that. I, I mean, I, I was so hesitant. I said not re- for a while. I, I was really hesitant and um, it ended up being so fun and so for us too. Easy. And I'm like where we went with it. I would have never guessed in a million years. Uh, it was all um, you. It's just you put out all that fun energy. So it just it's makes it easy, you know. Wow. It really pays to be alone a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you remember David David Spade? Look at his hair. It's perfect today. I love Damn. her. I know my face is still beat up. <laughs> <laughs> but the hair looks good. The hair looks good. Go the hair never you. lets you down, you know. You know what, Dane? I was thinking if you looked at we just were talking to Mike Myers, and if you looked at all our backdrops, you couldn't tell anyone has any money. <laughs> Mike's just <laughs> blank. Mine's shitty, all white, boring. I know. I got to spruce goose it up. We used to tease a guy in high school who had really young hair. I can't explain it, but he had like 10-year-old boy hair. So he did a song, young hair, get out of my head. You, <laughs> you belong in a cradle bed. You better run, run. hair. You're much too young, hair. Sorry, I'm not oh a singer, Sherry. God. You can sing. God, I know that song. Yeah, what? Uh, yeah, it's like some classic. Young girl, get out of my that's, mind. Yeah, that's my it. My love for you is way out of <laughs> mind. <laughs> but <a> run, girl. <laughs> You're much too know. young, girl. <laughs> You're much too young, girl. Oh, that's all your girlfriends, David. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. No, Sherry. A lot of those old songs were like, "You're 16." You're kind of a little young for me. I'm a pedophile. I'm a pedophile and you're mine. <laughs> she said, I'm just like 17 that. and you know what I mean. What do you mean? <laughs> just 17, you know what I mean? He goes, no, in the song, I'm 17. You're like, I know, but you're an adult singing it. We don't like it. No, he, his original lyric was, she, she was just 17, a real beauty queen. And then Lennon was the one who said, and you know what I mean? So that's how they work together. <laughs> just like Sherry worked together. With all her bandmates. Sherry O'Terry. <laughs> remember you did the cheerleaders with Will? Do you remember talk? that, Sherry? Or <laughs> Do you, you don't remember, remember the cheerleaders? Oh, my gosh. If I could tell you every time I was in the gynecologist's office and they said to me, <laughs> ask me to do a cheer. <laughs> it was like, um, I'm going to need my legs uh, to hit the floor for this. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to operate you like a puppet. <laughs> 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 disgusting I disgusting i don't know where this podcast is off the rails right now we are so outside the lanes ladies and gentlemen this is the <laughs> f95 live we're, gonna, we're from... gonna try to get sherry out of her shell today uh oh. sherry oh terry was that was that intentional 
whoever named you? No, Sherry you know what? O'Terry. No, it was always pronounced Sherry O'Terry. My, I pronounce it Sherry, Sherry. O'Terry. I oh, never Sherry said O'Terry. Sherry O'Terry. Oh, I've been um, saying O'Terry for yeah. No, every, everyone does. It's too late. Sherry moved, O'Terry. Yeah, well, as soon as I moved to LA, you know, people said O'Terry oh, because why wouldn't it be pronounced that way if Sherry is E R I? It's show busy. Yeah, is E R I? But it, you know, but I never said <laughs> O'Terry. Oh, but then when I was uh, got SNL, and I remember I first when I first got there, Don Pardo walked uh, down the hallway, oh. and I couldn't believe how tall he was. And he came up to me and I love that he introduced himself with that voice as if you wouldn't know. And he said, Sherry, I'm Don Pardo. And I go, yes, you are. <laughs> and he goes, how would you like me to pronounce your name? I like the rhyme. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and did he did he do it? Did he say it? Yes. Yes. Did Sherry he ruin it by saying, Sherry O'Terry? Yeah. You know, my dad was a little disappointed, I think, you know, but. You know, it wasn't that much of a difference for me to to correct anybody. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, the rhyme was uh, nice, but that didn't happen till I moved to LA. I like it, Sherry. You were so wonderful on the show, but we we're calling you again because Phil Hartman, who I don't, uh, we don't even think you knew well because it was a different no, time. Didn't. But you are someone I think was probably either influenced or. Oh my gosh. He to me was like a dramatic actor <laughs> that did comedy. I'm on, I'm on. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bob Barker over there. Um, I've got, uh, but I remember when I first walked into the Groundlings ever in the early '90s, and everybody's headshots were on the wall, and the first two headshots I saw were Phil Hartman and Paul Rubens. Oh, and what's so funny is that we're doing this for Phil because I've been inundated on my Facebook of pictures of Paul and Phil because I'm going to Paul's funeral on on Sunday. Mm. But there's been so many photos of them when they first started the Groundlings. And there's a lot of them with Phil and Paul. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, they're just so young and it just looking at it like they're all laying all over the floor in and in, 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 in someone's dingy apartment like broke but having the time of their lives mm-hmm. you know and i just remember myself being in that position when you just went to people's houses or like houses like you know studio apartments yeah. and you're just fucking around and writing and being creative and the pictures of them being so young where it just made my eyes tear up. It was just like, it was just beautiful. And those two were the first ones that I saw. And I just, and then I became friends with Paul when we did Ally McBeal together. And I just, you know, talked to him about Phil being, you know, Captain Carl. Captain Carl, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and how it went from uh, Groundlings to Pee Wee's Playhouse. And then at that time, they were both, you know, at like the height of their success, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Phil's film noir love for, I feel like he was born in the wrong time era, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Him yeah. and John Lovitz, the two of them. Yes, yes. They could yes, go, yes, yes. they could go 40s so, so easily, you know? I, yes. And he was just so solid. In every way. I mean, it was, I think it was Jan Hooks who just said that he was the glue to the, to the cast at that time. Sure. Yeah. And Jan was the other glue. My God, Jan was another. Yeah. I mean, she's a sung hero. I'm not going to say unsung because everyone knows. I love If you bring up Jan, it's unreal. It's just. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I would say um, Jan and Nora. I mean, they both had, I mean, of course, the Sweeney sisters. Sweeney sisters. Attitudes. Nora with Pat. It's. Uh, Pat, you know, yeah. when she had the talk show that mm-hmm. cracked me up. Oh, yeah. Um, but oh, God, I got to meet Jan and that was really exciting. But um, and then I just was thinking about between all the voices they did on The Simpsons, mm-hmm. you had yeah. news radio, you, I mean, and then what he did on SNL between like Frankenstein and, <laughs> and like Ed McMahon and 
Um, but the funniest thing that I love that he did was, uh, oh, two things, was um, uh, the, the caveman, unfrozen caveman mm-hmm. lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, how you, who thought, how he thought, <laughs> I'm going to put pair a lawyer with a Neanderthal. <laughs> And it just Jack, Jack Handy. Jack Handy, of course. Really? Yeah. We haven't done this yet on, on, on our, our special show, but would you like to hear a clip from Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer? Yeah, let's like hear 30 it. seconds. Yeah. All right, Greg, cue that up and we'll that'll be fun to hear. Sure this. Could you give me another drink? I'm sorry, sir, but the chief steward says you've already had enough. But you don't understand. I need <laughs> this drink. I'm a caveman and I'm frightened by your strange <laughs> flying machine. <laughs> So get me another douche and water pronto. <laughs> we got a lot of clips. But yeah, I, I, I hadn't seen that one, him playing the, the, the lawyer oh, wasted on my, an airplane. I mean, he was so like, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, he just was so like sarcastic and it just cracked me up. But, and I loved his Ed McMahon. Um that stupid laugh that he he did as Ed McMahon. He was so <laughs> condescending as the caveman. It like a <laughs> condescending caveman. Yeah. It's just like, what in the world? To and be written perfectly and played perfectly. Written perfectly. And um, but my favorite was how he did Frank Sinatra as such a dick. <laughs> 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 it was such a different It made me laugh so hard. Like I wanted more sketches with him being Frank Frank Sinatra. So when he hosted the show, as an when I was on, mm-hmm. I was so excited. And um, so I was a little shocked because I was I was pretty excited and um I just thought he was such a pro. And so Molly and I were doing Leg up with Ann Miller and Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, we got to do this with him and Fra- Frank Sinatra. It was so funny. He was just like that, like just such a dick. <laughs> um, that's Frank. And um, it's just talking seemed, down to you as dames or something. Yeah. And broad dames and everything. <laughs> but like, I mean, we held our own. We held our own, but it was. Um, uh, you know, um, but one of the, it was just so funny. And I remember when we first wrote Leg Up, Lauren called me in his office oh. and he goes, Sherry, uh, what demographic are you going for? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was, for people who don't know, it was two song and dance people, obviously <laughs> famous, famous people from musicals in the 40s and 50s. And, <laughs> and I truly didn't, like I'm just starting television. I'm not even thinking of a demographic. What's my you know? demo of this sketch? Yes. Yeah. And I go, uh, what do you say? And he was serious and he waited for me to respond. I went, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, no one knows who Ann Miller and Debbie Reynolds is. <laughs> and then I go, uh, and I said, well, maybe it, I think even if they don't know, who they are, they they still might think it's funny. And then he was mm. just kind of just was like, mm. Mm. <laughs> and then we did it. And it was like, it was great. Oh, I think I even told you guys this before, but I think the second time we did it, it was Phil coming on. And I'm like, oh my God, we can have him do Frank Sinatra. And it was, he was so awesome. I mean, just nice. Polite. Where'd you see him? So you had to pitch it to him. Is it is it tricky? Because you know you look up to the guy. And he, where did do you meet him in that Monday meeting, or where do you meet him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I think I would. I was never great in the pitch meetings. <laughs> I would I would never try to get a laugh in the pitch meeting. It was oh, already, you'd save it. No, it was just too intimidating. It was scary. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, I just said what I was going to do, and next. You know, oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I never tried to make it funny. I think I might have just said, uh, we're thinking of doing a leg up with uh, um, Phil as Frank, as Frank Sinatra. Okay. And- All right. Chris Parnell. <laughs> oh. Right. Because Lauren goes around the room and he goes, that's it, Sherry. OK, Chris Parnell. <laughs> Maybe a leg up. <laughs> Molly, I guess you're in on leg up. Anything else? 
<laughs> yeah, it was like, please, next, next. <laughs> get off me, yeah. <laughs> get off me. Because um, the host is staring at you, Lauren's staring at you, and every fucking person in that room is 30 people going, that's it? Uh, I didn't even care. Truly, I didn't care. I just I just wanted to be done with me. But, um, and then he did, <laughs> what else did I love that he did? The anal retentive chef. Oh, like, right. Who, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, and all the Simpson characters, it's like, I would have loved his career, <laughs> you know, That's because a, there was just so, so fun. many, there was just so many things that he could do. And he was doing, you know, animated voiceovers. Um, he had that amazing voice. Like Chris Parnell had that kind of voice, mm-hmm, that yeah. radio voice. The and announcer, then, yeah. And then, of course, and then he goes to news radio. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, what a varied, a, you know, uh, career that he had. He just, there wasn't anything that he could do. And yet he was kind of like low key. Yeah. Very low key. He was you know? brilliant, but low key. And then he would suddenly just, they, you'd see him on, on, on 8H. And I think he played Barbara Bush or something. You'd see him in this ridiculous... <laughs> outfit you know and then he would just crush it and then kind of go back to his you know magazines about motorboats so yeah (laughs) somebody said to me uh (laughs) it was daryl maybe not that daryl copies anybody daryl has his own you know but he copied you know clinton maybe a little bit from phil and I go, yeah, just like I copied Ross Perot from Dana. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, you, you know influence. where I got Ross Perot from Ross Perot. <laughs> yes, so, I know you did. I can't claim it. I mean, I, I just lifted it from you. You did no, all the work. Can I finish one time? That's all I have left. <laughs> Thirty years later, that's it. It's James Brown as Ross Perot. <laughs> Can I finish one time? But uh, you did it great. I thought, you know, I never had any sort of, they can't do it because I did. I don't even think, even with George Bush Sr., I mean, anybody's available for to do an impression of. You can't well, say Well, I, I know. But like, like to me, sometimes it's a per- what I liked about what you did is you always did a take on somebody. You didn't worry so much about doing them exactly. And when someone does a take on somebody, their own unique take on them, it's funnier to me. Sherry, you're probably a kindred spirit that at some point I am trying to amuse myself within reason. So when I would extenuate some of these people, it just would make me laugh inside that the audience is hearing and accepting that this is what this person is. So, you know, I totally I, it was like with that's what I did with Barbara Walters. I was just kind of like, how can I have a different take on her, uh, um, you know, and just studying, studying, studying her. And then once you the audience accepts it and you can go off from there once the audience buys it you know yeah i mean i think gilda who was adorable and brilliant she had her own take baba wawa but yours yours is kind of extraordinary because you recently did it on one of those new year's eve shows and it was so out of the blue i was just clicking around and there you were could you could you just do 10 seconds of it just just for me? Can you or, just do one hour. Could you do a one woman <laughs> show right now? Could We're recording. <laughs> no, uh, no, can I I'll tell you a story? The the um I was all ready to do Barbara this past New Year's Eve, um, promoting her own podcast. From mm. Stature to the Streets, brought to you by Dokalax. How did you view saw stool? <laughs> <laughs> See that take of those rhythms? There's something about him teased out from her, you know. You kind of sound I, like her, though. You do sound like her. Oh I, yeah. And I'll tell you. And I'll tell you. I um, I wrote the whole thing, and it, we had pictures in the back because what she was doing is she was going to have you know people from rappers and and all that stuff. She was going to have her podcast, and then <laughs> she was going to compare the rappers to who they were like in her day. You know, like <laughs> Takashi six nine. Um, uh, oh, and I say something about a um, Spanish rebel was you know agreed. Tr- Trini Lopez. <laughs> okay, Trini Lopez. <laughs> like truly, I was. You know, we'll go from Lizzo to Liza. From uh, <laughs> I had them all paired up. Yeah, like yeah. who would be the um the older equivalent? That's I a see. lot of work too. It was yeah, and like I did from uh, from Styles, Harry Styles, and Sadaka. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I did this whole thing and I had um, the pictures up and uh, uh, the both of them next to whoever I was pairing up with each other. And um, so I rehearsed it the night before New Year's Eve. I was at CNN and then I went downstairs to meet my friend for dinner and I had the wig, the outfit, the whole look. And they said, Sherry, it was really cr- loud in the restaurant. She just passed. And I went, oh, what? Uh-huh. And I said, wow, what? Who? Sherry, I, I'm telling you, it was five minutes later. I go down to meet my friend and Barbara just passed. Hmm. And I just welled up. It didn't feel real. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I was in such shock, you know, that the timing and everything. Um, and I thought I knew that, you know, she was up there and everything, but I just loved being able to, because if she was younger, there wasn't any news medium that she would not have thrown her hat into. And so I could see her doing a podcast. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah. She so, was driven, driven, driven. Oh, yeah. I mean, she kept up mm-hmm. with, you know, um, and so I went home. I went, I went to my hotel and I couldn't sleep, you know, and I thought, and I just, from a stream of consciousness, I just started writing and mm-hmm. they called me at like, one in the morning and said, we want you to say something. And, Mm. and I said, it's funny because I've just been writing. And so I go, why don't you just take what you want from what I wrote? And then, you know, and so I sent what I wrote to them and they go, uh, Sherry, we're going to, I want you to say exactly what you wrote. And I go, yeah, but this is just more personal. It's got no, background information she goes everybody's gonna have her background information it's the personal thing that not everybody is gonna have Mm -hmm. and you have a personal connection you know to her and um so i did and i thought to myself um i'm so lucky like in a way that i have this platform to at least say what she meant to me Mm -hmm. you know and then my social media was like Everybody was reaching out to me saying that I was the first person they thought of. Mm-hmm. And I thought to yeah. myself, me, <laughs> you know, like, I guess that's the reference or whatever because of SNL mostly, you know, I, I mean, no, completely. Cause it was SNL, mm-hmm. but like, it made me feel like her daughter in a way, you know, people were worried about me huh. and saying they're sorry to me to express their own grief. Yeah. You know, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Five minutes after I rehearsed it, and oh my god, I'm so sad that I never got the chance to do it. But um, I should have just done the whole thing on your show. Yeah, why didn't you? <laughs> we just we just saw a little snippet, <laughs> mm-hmm. and a one, and a two, and a three. No pressure, sure. Terry Witz snippets. That's a great story. Wow, I mean, I mean, a poignant story. <laughs> It's interesting how you get connected to sometimes when you do impressions of people and then they pass and, you know, people want to talk yeah, to you. And, and so many people, you know, they're grieving. It's, and it was their, think of you as their it was their, yeah. I mean, I grew up, you know, she was in my, my whole television watching from mm-hmm. ever since I was a kid and be, doing her as an adult like that. It's crazy. And um, being able to interview her as her, on her last view show was one of the highlights of my career. Wow. Sherry, she interviewed me. Did I tell you that? Did she? I have a picture of me and her because she did a spinoff show called uh, the nine most uninteresting people of 2006. (laughs) No, I was, it was one of those interesting shows. I I made some cut of, she interviewed like seven people, you know what I mean? And, uh, because I remember I was out of town. They made me fly in for it. And I have a picture. And then she wrote, I told her that my mom loved her, blah, blah. And then she wrote my mom a note. Just She just stopped what she was doing and wrote my mom a note about me. Because she just interviewed me. And then she said, give this to your mother. 
Oh my God. That's sweet. That is so sweet. Like the teacher, David did yeah. good. Yeah, that was what she was. This this you guy. You got a sticker. You got a Barbara Walters. This guy's sticker. gonna make it. My mom's like, he already made it. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know who he is. Really, I don't know what he does. <laughs> um, but I see potential. Um, <laughs> anyway, Sherry, we will jump off in a All second. Right. But is there anything else you want to add, Dana? Anything you? Me personally, no. I just I couldn't <laughs> agree more with everything Sherry said about. Sh- I about love that you saw Phil. Phil. You got a, to work with them. Yeah. You got oh, to it was a like show with them. Yeah, from the first day of walking in for the first time ever at the Groundlings and seeing his picture and then seeing him on SNL and then doing a sketch with him on SNL, it was like, wow, this has come full circle. Yeah. You know, my journey uh, with Phil, he really was inspiring. Up next is Conan O'Brien, we all know and love. And uh, Conan worked with Phil on the show and he also worked with him a lot on The Simpsons, which we get into. Conan, you're part of your resume, writer for two years on The Simpsons. And so since we're doing this tribute to the great Phil Hartman, he also did a lot of voices. Yep. Did, did you interact with him? Uh, yeah. we we uh, I wrote an episode, uh, the monorail episode, and I wrote a part for this smooth-talking kind of music man salesman. And I called him Lyle Langley. And it was just always <laughs> written kind of as a Phil role, because Phil did a lot of great voices on The Simpsons. And uh, so it was fun because I went to The Simpsons after I was at SNL. So I worked Mm -hmm. for for a bunch of years with Phil and you guys at SNL. Mm -hmm. Then I move on to The Simpsons and I write this episode, but there was a chance to kind of reconnect uh, professionally with Phil which was a really cool thing. And uh, one of the things I like about that episode is Phil is obviously great. He's fantastic. Uh, and he he played a character also called Troy McClure on The Simpsons, yeah. who's just beloved. Yes. He, he played a few great characters, but uh, I was very fortunate because I wrote this part for him and he could do it. And uh, he, of course, was amazing, as he always was. And what's nice about that episode is it just bounces around in the universe those Simpsons episodes uh, just rocket around the world. So it doesn't matter where I go. There's all these people that have, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess you did some stuff in late night, but man, Simpsons, dude, you know? And so yeah. it resonates. Uh, it really resonates with them. I, I'm not familiar with that episode. So when you said Music Man, was Phil kind of talk singing as well? Yes, or? yes, yes. There's a part where basically as the Music Man tried to sell uh, the episode starts out as kind of a Music Man parody, and then uh, the the second half of it is a um, Irwin Allen disaster movie parody. Uh, <laughs> and um, but the first part is Lyle Langley shows up in town, and he's a guy who's the town is coming to some money, and they're trying to figure out how to spend it. And of course, Marge wants to spend it sensibly. And then uh, uh, you know this guy stands up who's wearing a straw boater, and it's Ooh. it's Phil. And yeah. it's Phil doing his, mm-hmm. you know, Phil was so good at smooth characters. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. good at kind of saying, hey, I'm I Lyle think Langley. I could help you out here. I'm Lyle Langley. And, you know, uh, and then he basically tells them, what you guys want is a monorail. <laughs> which, and I, I loved monorails were just always felt so stupid and silly to me, like this fake promise of the future that doesn't really accomplish much. It's just a, a trolley in the sky. And, uh, so anyway, he sings a, a talk, sings a song about the uh, <laughs> about the monorail. And, you know, it, it uh, you know, it, and it's uh, and, and of course, Phil did it beautifully and it was really fun. <laughs> and it's just nice that it's out there. And then a nice come about uh, all these years later was the Simpsons did a big reunion show. I don't know if it was their 30th or must have been their 30th. And they uh, had a big show at the Hollywood Bowl and Matt Groening and James L. Brooks asked me and and the Simpsons writer said, hey, Conan, would you come back and sing the monorail song at the Hollywood Bowl with the Hollywood Gay Men's Choir? (laughs) And the answer to that is yes. (laughs) Oh, that, I remember that event. Yeah, I didn't go to it. I remember that. It was huge. That was really fun. It was really fun. And it was one of those uh, moments where you just, you get to take your long, thin spoon and pick the the whipped cream and the cherry off the top of the sundae. It's just perfect because not a lot of work. Just come in, 
We, I think we did it twice. We did two shows. You get a nice score and it's just, it's the fucking Hollywood bowl. Mm -hmm. And it was, just, it was very nice to just, cause obviously the way I did, it was just to channel Phil as best I could. Uh, did you, did you dress up like the, his animated yes, character? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. They, they got me uh, the, the suit, the Lyle Lindley suit and the hat. And I have a great photo they sent me of me holding my hat in the air, full song and dance you know, Jimmy Cagney and Yankee Doodle Dandy with the Hollywood Gay Men's <laughs> Choir behind me. And it's a it's a prized possession because it looks like, wow, Conan had a very successful career in vaudeville. Mm. Uh, so it, <laughs> that makes me happy. But um, yeah, it's you know, I have to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy you guys are talking about Phil, but he is one of those people that. Uh, all these years later, it's still surreal to me that he's not with us because he's I don't know. He's he's such an indelible character, you know, such an indelible person. And it's, it's yes. un and so he's one of those people that I I think like, no, no, Phil's still here. He's still here. He's, you know, that's you uh, haven't seen him for like a while. He, yeah. I just haven't seen him for a while, but he's here. Uh, because I I do think if you're talking about util a utility player, a guy who could do everything, I think we'd all agree that Phil Hartman was kind of the ultimate utility player for SNL. He could just be everything. Do you know what I mean? He could be, uh, you know, he could be, it's crazy. I'm trying to think of who else in that cast could be the father, the grandfather, the punk kid, the, <laughs> the boyfriend, you know I mean? Frankenstein, yeah. the boyfriend, uh, you know, the, the jealous caveman. weirdo. I mean, the caveman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you cannot, and he used the to game show himself. Host. The game show host, uh, the upper so, crust cad, the, the <laughs> upper crust cat. I mean, it's just you can't <laughs> name anything he couldn't be. And within different sketches, he would, you know, in one episode, it'd be like I'm the father greeting the young punk at the door. And, Come on in, son, and I'm going to talk to you. And then he's the young punk at the door in a leather jacket. <laughs> In the in the next sketch, that's that's <laughs> you know, it's three minutes later. It's I'm hard pressed to think of anyone else who could do that. You know, Conan, when you do this, The Simpsons, going back to that for one second. If if you write it, I don't know how it works there, but do you say, can we reach out to Phil for this? That's important to me, or is that out of your hands? You know, I think it was so obvious that it was Phil, uh, and I probably uh, you know, there's a good chance I wrote Lyle Langley, you know think Phil Hartman, but Phil Hartman, mm -hmm. they had him on speed dial. So that wasn't a big issue. Mm -hmm. The thing that was uh, funny about that episode is I wrote a cameo in it for George Takei and uh, George Takei, because at the second half, all these celebrities get invited on the monorail, which has been cheaply made and it's bound <laughs> to uh, self-destruct and go oh haywire. And uh, yeah, and so I wanted George Takei, who I was obsessed with, <laughs> and George Takei said no. I mean, it's The Simpsons, and it's The Simpsons, uh, let me point out, it's The hey Simpsons in, in, in like 1991. And he said no, and we said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. He said, it makes fun of public transportation. And I'm on- <laughs> Oh my. I, I'm on the, oh my, I'm on the, oh my. I'm on the, I'm on the transportation, I'm on the transportation board here in San Francisco oh and we can't be mocking the concept of mass transport. And so I thought, what the hell? And so then uh, Al Jean uh, told the bookers to reach out to someone else. And so they came back and they said, Leonard Nimoy will do it. And I said, what? Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> he wow. outranks, he outranks yeah. Sulu. This is take a, that. This is incredible. This is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, Scotty uh, passed as well. But yeah. yeah. So uh, I got to go to a recording studio and there was Leonard Nimoy and he uh, he did it and uh, said one of my favorite exchanges, which is at the end when after there's all this carnage and everything, uh, there's just a close up of Leonard Nimoy and he says, well, my work here is done. And Barney, the drunk, goes, you didn't do anything. And he goes, <laughs> and, and, and Leonard Nimoy says, didn't I? And then beams out. And uh, it's just so stupid. <laughs> Sounds didn't, like love it. That's, yeah. that's where Barney I? would talk to him like that. Yeah. Didn't I? Barney should look up to him. You're right. Well, Barney was intoxicated. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot. 
We all do things when we're drunk that we regret. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you regretted mm. that one. And uh, <laughs> we were talking to Alec Baldwin about, you were there for, you remember Green Hilly? That was a funny one I always talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, remind me about Green Hilly. Green Hilly, Alec's first show, and he, the music would swell up, and he, he kissed someone, and then someone else comes in, and barges in, his wife comes in, and, and says, what are you doing? And then he kisses her, the music mm. comes up. And then right. Phil Phil comes in and breaks him up full, and tries full to fight great him. Full great Gatsby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Put up your dukes. Is this a, was this yeah. a Jack Handy, do you think, or a, like a Jim uh, Downey? It sounds like that. I don't think it was quite enough to be a Jack Handy, but then he kisses, uh, I think, Nora, and then Phil says, that's my wife, sir. And then they turn around, they go to fisticuffs, and then they gaze into their eyes, then they kiss. Yeah, nice. And then a dog is outside going, ruff, ruff. <laughs> <laughs> And everyone goes, oh boy. <laughs> and he kisses the dog, but um, really goes for it. No, that's uh, that's actually Alec, but Phil and Alec, uh, Alec remembered that one. And um, it is funny. There was one, do you remember? I don't think I was there. I don't think you were, Conan. And Dana, you had left 30 years. It was- um What? It was when he played an acting coach and he goes, this is something, this is nothing. This is something, this is nothing. He oh, was oh, an acting coach I, I know, for like- But I wasn't there, yeah. It was Will That's Ferrell. That's when he always, hosted. Oh, yeah. was, oh yeah. was? Oh yeah, when he went back yeah. and hosted. He was hosting. I just saw that this weekend and I was like, God damn, I, almost everything he says in that whole thing is a joke. It's all funny. I don't know if you had this experience, but my thing was people ask me about Phil and I always say, if you saw him on the show, that's who he was because- he didn't, at least I never penetrated the Phil exterior. And what I, my memory, my biggest memory of Phil was uh, I'd be with Odenkirk and Smigel and, you know, uh, Greg Daniels, and we'd be working on something. And, he'd, and Phil would come rushing in and he'd see us and he'd go, keep them flying, boys, keep them flying. And <laughs> give like a big thumbs up mm -hmm. and... I think if I had said to Phil, I think I'm having a nervous <laughs> breakdown and I'm really worried about my my health. I need someone to talk to. He'd have said, well, you just keep him flying there, kid. <laughs> you know, I, think, I don't know. I could never crack through yeah. that guy. But uh, he was. Uh, I think it just made him laugh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, hey, <laughs> fellas. Yeah, you fellas, walk, hey, you, fellas. You walk in that writer's room and there's no one there. And he goes, he's reading, uh, you know, Fisherman Weekly. And then yeah, he looks yeah. up and goes, David Spade, letting everyone know who's boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he goes back to his magazine. I go, oh. I remembered I went s skiing once. It was one of those weird occasions where I forget what, why this happened, but I'm with a couple of other writers and we decided to go skiing in some small hill, like, outside New York City, like a tiny hill, but we're desperate to go skiing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget what happened, but I think one of the writers wiped out and we were standing around the writer uh, trying to saying like, hey, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I just got to find my other ski. And just then this guy comes down the mountain with perfect form, perfect form and <laughs> skis right up to us. And he's just like, hey, fellas, what's, <laughs> oh, no. what's happening? And it was <laughs> Phil. And uh, of course he was an amazing skier. And an amazing, I mean, he was one of those guys that you touched on, David, who fly fishing, boating, parasailing. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could name anything <laughs> that he hadn't done. You know, those weird, yeah, those weird things where like a propeller is pushing you along and there's like a kite pulling you. And yeah, exactly. I think, oh, I've got one of the, I've got four of those. Fantastic. Well, keep them flying, <laughs> boys, and then take off. Do you want a hydroplane <laughs> on the dinner break? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So did he have a ski suit on that was yes. very, looked very of course. together, <laughs> like one color yeah, or something? It, yeah, it right? was, he was immaculate. Yeah. Of course, yeah. we were all, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts, so I was skiing in my jeans, probably with long underwear underneath it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, wearing a t-shirt that I probably had in high school. And he's, he's, he's just, I had never <laughs> seen anyone look, because people don't look like, that in new england maybe they do now but but i had never seen it growing up everyone just looked like shit mm. when they were skiing and there was a rope pull and then here comes this guy who looks like he's in the olympics and uh <laughs> hiya fellas all right you know and i think if we had said well it's robert smigel he wiped out and we think he's dead well that sounds rough Keep him flying, boy. <laughs> <Take off. laughs> He's got a broken femur. 
<laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that 2023. Keep them flying, boys. Yeah. Keep them flying, boys. It, it really means nothing, as no. funny as far. It's very positive. It's very positive. <laughs> keep on keeping on. Yeah. So Troy McClure was based, that was the one I think most people know. And yep. I know the monorail was, was, I guess, a one off of just a, one of the most memorable ones. Um, it was a, it was you know Troy McClure was great. And what then was I he? What they, was Troy McClure? Troy was McClure a, was always doing was it a weatherman. Or I, no, Troy McClure was always a spokesperson. So whenever they showed any kind oh, right, of right. film or whenever there was a commercial, it would be like, "Hi, I'm Troy McClure. If you want to yeah. learn how to, you know." And then he he would always he would list his <laughs> acting credits. You know, you probably know me from, and then three jokes. Or maybe you've seen me in two jokes and uh, he, he was fantastic. It was great. It was a great running character. And then, um, you know, they did the right thing when Phil died. They they retired Troy McClure because obviously it's it's animation. They could have tried to get someone mm -hmm. else to do it because it was such a great go to. But uh, of course, that wasn't didn't it wouldn't have sat right with anybody. So, uh you know, when I just said, was he a weatherman? A Simpsons guy shot me like a sniper, a fan. through the Yeah, window. yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, my son, <laughs> my son, who is 17, knows every Simpsons episode uh, by heart. And um, what, it's funny because when he started watching them as a much younger kid, he had no idea I had anything to do with it. And then uh, he was working his way through the episodes. And then he got to mine. And I saw just for the first time, a half glimmer of respect from my son, which, ah. quick, which quickly disappeared. <laughs> but anyway, the important thing is that he uh, he knows all the episodes and loves Troy McClure and knows all of those. He's not the kind of guy that memorizes, but he just absolutely loves Troy McClure and is very happy when he shows up in a Simpsons episode and loves that joke rhythm because it was always... Hi, I'm Troy, McC Troy McClure. You probably know me from, and then it was just hilarious <laughs> <laughs> joke bucket. It's always fun to say hi and then your name. You know, yes, yeah, exactly. Set the table immediately and get to the jokes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's also great, especially if you've said something else first. Like, this looks like a real, you know, this looks like a real problem. Then see the camera. Hi. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, uh, wow, that was nasty. Hey, I'm yeah, exactly. We should just all do that. Curiosity. I, I mean, I don't. I just probably know the answer, but to work with Phil or just work on SNL and then go to The Simpsons was it like a lot easier, more difficult, or what was the uh, different? Big, I would yeah. say less was well, funny because um, eventually I found it to be less stressful. I mean, I loved SNL. It was like you know just really the defining time of my youth, but I. It, as you guys know, it's also terrifying uh, and um, and it can f there's a lot of pressure. And one of the things that I appreciated about The Simpsons was everybody's working together. Uh, we were all hmm. we were all, you know, it, at SNL, everyone's writing different sketches and trying to get them onto limited real estate. Yeah. And um, and then suddenly at um, and, and what was nice is later in the week, people would all come together and help to improve all the sketches. But early in the week, it, you really there was no way around it. You're you're fighting for a square inch of uh, of land in a very small country. Uh, I'm taking that too far, but like say Israel, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, and so it's it's keep it's, going. It's, <laughs> and let's just say you want to be near the sea, but that's the that's the West Bank. Um, no, but so what what gets tricky is that you know that can get there. Sometimes you can feel other people's elbows, and I'm sure I threw a few elbows too. And what happens when you go to a show that's putting out 20 episodes a year? Uh, and everybody's working together on the scripts. I mean, I wrote the monorail episode and then all the writers came together and just did all this punch up on it to make it so much better. Right. And I, and I thought, and, and it felt like all the oars are going, everyone's pulling the oars in the same direction. Cause if somebody cracks it, if somebody comes up with the answer, we all get to go home early. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in that way, uh, initially the Simpsons terrified me cause it was such a crazily powerful writing room, but, uh, eventually I started to see the advantages of that kind of work, which is individually, you don't feel as much, 
uh, personal uh, fear, you know? If I was there, I'd be crazy, Dana, and I'd walk by his office and go, you know, I, I was thinking about a monorail thing I was working on like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> just to get in your head and be like, well, I didn't steal it. I'm like, no, no, I'm just saying yeah. you might've heard something just similar in minds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mind games. Yeah, gamesmanship. But yeah, also if you crack an episode, like if you, and this is the last, we'll bug you about this, but if you crack an episode of The Simpsons, and everybody likes it, then it's such a great victory because then everyone's like, oh, I get what you're doing. I get that idea. We all agree it's funny. And now let's pile in and fix it. I mean, it's great, right? That's yeah. Well, I think get- what, yeah, it, you know, you pitch the ideas uh, and if the idea gets chosen, then eventually you get to write up a first draft yeah. and then everybody jumps in. But uh, man, when everybody jumps in and you have, um, all that horsepower behind you oh, making sure. the show just better and better and better. Uh, it's it's a delight. It's a real delight. All right, let's let him go, Dana. He did a good job. All right, I love you guys. And uh, let's let's hang out soon at one of those meals where we just make fun of each other. Let's go to our, our favorite, you know, kind of Japanese style Koi. place. Koi. Let's do it. I'll see and, you on the text and, chain. And all hang right. out. All right, Conan. <laughs> Bye. Peace out. Thank Conan. you. Up next is Alec Baldwin, who spoke about Phil Hartman when he was our guest on Fly on the Wall. And so we invited him to be on. Here he is. So we're going to do this like every six weeks? What are we going to do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my consultant? Am I, am I a featured guest? You are really. You're the... Uh... I guess, I mean, well, yeah, I, guess, I mean, it's... So no, I just keep coming back. You're like we have shot. to have you underneath. It's Fly on the Wall with us, and then you're just underneath... <laughs> Uh, wait, featuring wait. featuring Alec Ball. Wait, wait, Speed. Did you just say lamb chop? What did you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see girls with fake eyelashes, I'm like, is this fucking lamb chop again? What's happening? Lamb chop, Sherry Lewis, 1965. I, I know. love that show. Uh, old old reference lost on younger viewers. I did a TV movie once, and I come to work the second day, and everybody's huddled up the producer, the director, they're all. all upset you know they all seem pretty grim in a circle and i walk up and i go what's going on fellas and and the star was this veteran veteran actor who wore a lot of makeup he wore like you know three four pounds of makeup <laughs> every day he had like a lot of makeup on. <clears throat> and i said uh fellas what's the matter he goes well we looked at the dailies the director said he says jim's got on more jim's got on more makeup than dorothy malone <laughs> Even I don't know Dorothy Malone. Speaking speaking of not wearing makeup, I've always felt that Hartman. I'm going to jerk the wheel this way now. Hartman, sure. this is the, jerk thank it you. back. Uh, it's Johnny Segway, ladies and gentlemen. Johnny Segway. Uh, <laughs> jo- uh, Hartman, uh, uh, I always this isn't true, but you always got the sense that he was like, "I'm not going to wear any makeup. I'll just conjure a caveman. <laughs> you know, I'll just make myself look like a caveman." <laughs> Like altered states, he go into a deprivation tank and come out looking like a kid. That's like when he did Charlton Heston. He just completely <laughs> became Charlton. <laughs> Guys, fellas, I, we've been here for that. I can't do it, but he became he became <laughs> Chuck Heston. That was part of his bag of tricks. The chameleon, the everyman, the glue. And uh, you mentioned him uh, a, a few weeks ago. You brought him up spontaneously when we were, uh, we did our. But he was, you know, uh, he was, you know, the better, uh, I wouldn't say the better, but a distinctive group of people, not just SNL veterans and alums, but other people in the comedy world. They're, they're, they're good actors as well. You know, they, they're not just stand up talent and improv talent and sketch comedy talent where. Easy, easy. Yeah, I was going to say, because those people are fucking. <laughs> like fucking God, they're, they're fucking god awful, those people. <laughs> but, but you got you got to cut around them. It's like you don't know what. <laughs> there's there's the Emmy for editing right there when you have those people on board. But um, mm-hmm. but Thank but uh, Har- you know, Harmon was a good actor. He would because like he would play off of you. Mm-hmm. He'd let what you say affect him. Mm-hmm. Whereas I worked with some comedy people where they're just staring at you, winding up. Wait to deliver their, their line. They're waiting. They're they're ready. They're they're. It's like they're winding up a pitch to deliver their next line. <laughs> they have like a glaze in their eyes. <laughs> I s- <laughs> they're just like are you done with your line are you done with your line you done? note to self do not have a glazed look in your eyes when doing Saturday Night Live um, but yeah I mean I'm just thinking 
the other day, but since you hosted many times with Phil, because Phil was could do anything, you must have done yeah. many, many sketches with Phil Hartman, right? I mean, I did a bunch. I yeah. did a bunch. Yeah, he was, uh, and he he was. It was like weird guys who they would go moment to moment with you. Uh, Meadows would do that. Mm -hmm. Meadows was really good moment to moment. Like he was waiting. He, like he let things you say affect him. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, not just, this is nothing to do with SNL or comedy <clears throat> performers, but there's actors I've worked with where, you know, whatever your line is, they just immunize themselves against whatever you're going to say. They don't really let it affect them in any mm -hmm. way. You know, they're like, they're super tough. Yeah. Right. Uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Would you that is cool. would you ever yeah. considering uh, is the actors studio still around? I mean, because you'd be a good host of that. I am uh, um, the co president at the actors studio with Ellen Burstyn and Pacino. See, I knew something was going on with the actors. Yeah, you, studio. You, you, somebody in your research gave you that. You teed, that was teed up a little too soft. I don't no, think no, so. that was no research. That was just intuiting the way you talked about acting just now. But basically, to go full circle, uh, the thing about Phil is that he was a great actor and he was and, a good and, actor. A, and and a brilliant sketch player. He could do both, and um, we can play a clip. Do you, if I mention some oh, of these, oh yeah, yeah, they're we're just kind show of these fun. Sketches. Uh, Tell uh, me if you remember Frank them. Sinatra, Frankenstein. Um, you and he played lovers in a sketch. I don't know if it's just more Green yeah, Hilly. That Green one? Hilly. Green Hilly. Oh, was that Green Hilly? That's where I kissed the dog and the, I stick my tongue in the dog's mouth. <laughs> Alec, that, you got didn't you get an Emmy for that show? I got an Emmy for Green Hilly. For, for that sketch. <laughs> on my, on my, exactly. On my Emmy, it says for Green Hilly. No. Well, um, I remember I would use Green Hilly as a reference because that was my third show. I think I've told you this, but I was new and you came in and just fucking cleaned the clock. You were every sketch was pretty funny in that show. And I didn't know how good I had it because some hosts come in and, you know, shows are uneven. But that one, it was Green Hilly was, and the music comes up and then you kiss them, yes. you know, somebody that you get, and the music comes up and then you kiss someone else. You also did the, um, the soap opera that couldn't, guy that couldn't say the words right. Yes, you have canker of the East of Vegas. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> We've said canker for three years. No, canker. No, should, no, we, uh, should, we, should we look at Green Hilly? I think we yeah, have let's, it. Do you have the clip from Green Hilly? Just as I thought. Hi. It's not what it seems. Prepare to defend yourself, Mr. Cherrywood, if that's your real name. Oh, oh, help! Someone, please help! Help! <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> Here's the music. <laughs> well, I'll be going now. You just kissed. <laughs> he goes, I must be going. Uh, I must be going. Uh, wow. Uh, but my favorite, though, is when he's in the courtroom. When he's in the courtroom. Yeah. And yes. he says... Uh, and he says, you know, I was, uh, I fell into a crevasse. <laughs> Your ways are strange. No? Your yeah. ways, my favorite. I mean, I say, that line, I, but a I, say that, <laughs> I say that line to this day, like a waitress will come up and I'll say, can I have some ice? And she doesn't bring the ice. And I'm like, your ways are strange to me. <laughs> the, um, now, when you worked with him, were you like pals with him? And you got to hang out with him? Or was he one of these people that like went home and, you know, he was private. Um, did he hang? Yeah, he hung out a lot. Him, yeah, he did. we were all friends. Him and uh, his wife, Bren, and Lovitz. my wife, and Lovitz, and we lived close to each other after the show in Encino. We bought houses like two blocks away, and I came in with Phil. My first show was with Phil and Jan Hooks. Can you imagine? And I. Yeah, never oh, done God. sketch comedy, and suddenly I'm in this sketch with them. So, um, but Phil was private. He had so many other hobbies and interests. He was not interested in celebrity or show business per se. Mm -hmm. uh, but just when you look back on it, because he was just sort of quiet about it, and then you look back on it, and that's why we want to do the show. Like, and you look at these sketches and the range of him, and also we have talked about how he would play things so so real, and if you were kind of that it would carry the sketch, you know, 
And I don't think we had a better actor on the, on the show than he was as a, as a just playing the straight man when he wanted to, you know, he was just also like a really warm guy. There's people I worked with who, um, I mean, this, they're very rare, but they're, they they have certain kind of insecurity. So when you're around them, the whole dynamic is what I call log rolling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're going to go in the water. You know, they're just more clever than you ever could imagine. And, Mm -hmm. And they're very kind of uh, shy or awkward and, or <clears throat> they're just not, uh, uh, they're just not programmed that way. I went to go to that. Remember that old card game? I'm wondering, I'm assuming either one of you, but Norby Walters card game in West Hollywood. Norby. Did yeah. You, did you play at Norby's? I think George Siegel used to play in that. Yeah, exactly. He mm -hmm. was there. And I got invited to Norby's and for people who don't know, Norby Walters was in the music business. And he had uh, an apartment, uh, like a penthouse on top of a building near like Holloway, like near Barney's Beanery in that area, off yeah. of, uh, mm -hmm. right in, the, in that ridge on, uh, uh, off of uh, Sunset. And he and his wife, you come in, and they literally, it was like, you could only buy $100 worth of chips. Once you were out of the 100 you were out. It was over. This was not about spending money. Also, he had no alcohol. He had like Velveeta cheese. Coca-Cola <laughs> and he had like jujubes. He had like, uh, you know, like he had like candy and, like and, and it, yeah, exactly. It was, it was like M M and M's. It was like flight attendants walking around like you're on Southwest <laughs> airlines and he had nothing. You know what I mean? And the famous people that would come to this game, it was unbelievable. You know, uh, Harvey Corman would come and Tim Conway and all these amazing people. But one time I go, and Don Adams comes. Don oh. Adams. And I'm completely freaked out because here's Don Adams, who I've never in a million years would thought I would ever run into. He's in a white jumpsuit. I mean, a China white, not <laughs> cream. It's like as white as Spade's walls here. His, his, his jumpsuit is white. And it, like, he's in some, like he's in some FBI forensic team is coming to detox uh, the crime scene. <laughs> and he's sitting there and he doesn't say anything the entire time. He doesn't say anything. He takes his cards and he gestures for his cards. So I'm assuming that at some point someone's going to go for it. I mean, and, they're, and it's got to be done well. And I'm not that funny, quite frankly, but I, I, I just went for it. And I, it was my turn to turn over my cards. And I was like, you know, I, I have three of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me with this look in his eyes like, okay, okay, that's okay. I, I knew it was coming. That's okay. I wasn't sure. It was, I wasn't sure it was going to be you, but okay, that's that's okay. And Ma um, Maxwell Smart for our younger audience. Maxwell Smart, and it's like there's guys you meet who are people in the comedy world who are just dead serious. Do you, do you mm -hmm. feel? Do you see that? Have you seen that? Sure. Oh sure. yeah, or, or even extract the comedy out. I would say that Phil had. I I don't know. No ego in a sense. And like he was happy to maybe there was no sense of competition, even even in a friendly way. It was just he was just Phil. I mean, very secure about what he was doing. Is that how you found it with Phil? Yeah, no, he was just he was he was uh, I always find that I'm uh, I'm thrilled when somebody is that talented and they're that. Uh, gregarious and they're warm mm -hmm. and they're fun. You know what I mean? Because a lot mm -hmm. of people who I've met with, who there's an inverse proportion that the more talented and witty and and good writers they are and clever they are, not just doing uh, you know bits and stuff, but they're really very bright and talented. They're very shy and they're very awkward and they're not mm -hmm. very social. You know, and yeah. uh, Phil was this amazing. He was charming. He was really charming. And he, you know, because when I would when you meet people on a movie set or a TV show, uh, meet the crew the first day. So your brain is taking in all this stuff and you're meeting 20 people at once. And so you hate having to go, Hey, you, and how are you guys? You know, Phil knew every crew member. Hey, Bob, wow. Hey, Steve, uh, you know, even when they yeah. were changing in and out, just, just another gear that he had, you know, it's like, and treated yeah. everyone exactly the same complete completely just no you know what was sweet is when i was newer dana um that first first year or two i knew a little bit about stand-up because i was a stand-up that's why i got hired but to write a sketch is a whole different muscle and a whole new ball game that is so complicated and i would have to go up to someone like you know even alec if he came with nerve-wracking to go up to a big star or to go to the other cast members and and i remember phil was always very gracious like i'd go in i go i wrote this thing and 
you would play this guy and he goes sounds great and he goes tell me about it and then he goes all right we'll go get him so i'll i'll give it my best he was never condescending never like just staring at you going yeah yeah all right what do i got to do in this he was upbeat and made me feel like it had a shot whether it was good or bad you know and that i always remembered that it was very sweet of him i did i wrote him one one of these receptionist sketches and he actually got a big lap and then afterwards he goes hey thanks for that you know, like it was all me, <laughs> it was but sweet. very, very right. sweet. And just like pat on the back and kept you going, knowing you were all the new people were probably freaking out. He was, um, he was a sweetie. I mean, I mean obviously everybody sweetie. knows that he had this horrible ending, but it's like, God, when I heard that, I was really just so sickened. I thought that doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. But, um, he was really, um, listen, I'm not saying this to butter you up, but I mean, both of you were people who were like incredibly, Funny, you've had great careers in television and in films. I mean, my my son, Spain, is going to throw up when I say this, but my kids wanted to watch Tommy Boy the other day. <laughs> no, and yeah, they're, and, they're, and, there's, and there's Spade. It's a great <laughs> movie. Spade's playing a straight man there, and I thought, yep. mm -hmm. oh, look at Spade. He could have had a real serious acting career playing lawyers and bankers <laughs> and <laughs> judges <laughs> and doctors. I mean, look how serious <laughs> Spade is. Look at fucking serious <laughs> Spade. <laughs> No, serious spade. The thing about Tommy Boy, which I love, was is only one person could t could play Farley's part, but a couple of people could have played my part. You just really had to feed the guy, and uh, so I was lucky to be in that one. But I, I love that your kids have seen it because you always wonder how these things hold up. You know, you just go, well, it's still pretty funny because it's still goofy, lovable Farley, and uh, there was something pretty magnetic there. Oh, definitely, it's got to still hold up. Anyway, I got to run and go. I got to go run and get. No, my no, no dinner. you gave us plenty An of hour time. more. Hour 10 more. Thank you. Okay, okay no. thank you, Alec. Thanks for doing this. Up next, Robert Smigel, one of the uh, all-star great writers from Saturday Night Live and many other things, uh, who wrote for Phil, who worked on the Sinatra Group, the uh, million other sketches with Phil. And here he is chirping in. We're here with the great Robert Smigel, a friend of the podcast, who's graciously the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's the a friend of the podcast. So means when we ask for friend favors, he comes on. And so to remind our our fans that might be listening, Robert, extraordinary writer, wrote on the show from '86 till just last fall, mm -hmm. and. Um, <laughs> No, he wrote 86 years. Fingers crossed the strike ends. Yeah. I'm itching to get back. Robert told me something a while back because we actually talk not on the podcast or we're not recorded, but it was an observation just about, and it may sound self-congratulatory, but when Phil Hartman came to the show, I happened to be tagging along. I got there too. And so did Jan Hooks. And we were in the cold opening. Um, it's my first sketch. Well, actually, the first sketch, the cold opening was Madonna. Oh, she was the that, last previous year was all a dream. <laughs> that's right. She was the cold opening. It was coming off that very rocky year with uh, all these brilliant uh, actors who weren't necessarily sketch comics. So, so Robert, so you this first time you'd seen Phil Hartman perform, right? You knew he came from Groundlings, but. Well, I mean, I saw his audition and your audition, and I think they're probably the two most confident auditions in the history. <laughs> I of must the have show. faked it. I don't know. Wow, Dana, have, uh, David, have you seen their auditions? No, I just like that. I forgot you had a hand in hiring, so you got to. No, I didn't have a hand in hiring. I barely got back on that year. That was the year I was almost fired. That was after my first year. Oh, okay. And yes, if not for like Dennis Miller and Lovitz and Whitney. Uh, pushing for me. I would Robert was not too. Robert Smigel yet. Yeah, he was just Robert. And he wanted me to, he wanted to do an <laughs> Eric Gami sketch with Robin Leach. That was their first pitch to me. I think that so. right? it, was a, it was a really funny <laughs> I idea. Don't remember. But um, so I'm just in interested. So it's your second season. You see Phil, Phil second Hartman season comes in. And I, and well, Phil and Dana and Jan and Kevin and Victoria, but you and Phil and Jan were like the three sketch comedy pros that we never had before. Even and, though I'd um, never done sketch comedy. Even though you'd never done it and neither, and Jan had, was not a ground. No, she, she came from, think so. from the no, deep no. South. From, from, yeah, from the With deep South. Terry, Terry. <laughs> but, but, but you guys were just so expert 
at yeah, like you did the first sketch of the show after the monologue, which was called Game Show Psychic. And it was as if we were suddenly in a different show. Jim Downey said, the audience feels safe, was the way he put it. Yeah. Like he, they just know that the sketches are in the hands of people who know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> and it was your first show. All at ease well, for being nervous. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I'm sure you were faking it on some level, Dana. And I know God knows Jan was, you know, barely wanted to uh, get on wire. stage that but night. But when we were out there with those two, which I happened to, after that, with Church Chat, yeah. they came on and did these brilliant things and Phil did Jimmy Swaggart. Yes. But I think I was probably coming off them. Like, la Jan was a laugh button with her character. And Phil was just so in the pocket as the game show host. So you sort of ride the wave of the people you're with. But, you know, yeah. Yes. So Phil was always in the pocket. I mean, that was the thing about him is that he just became the characters like, you know, it, he just had that approach where he he just approached everything as like almost the way a serious actor would approach the role, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and and so like, you know, you came from stand up and you brought this entirely different, amazing thing to the show where like the audience kind of with you like they're they they can feel you underneath every impression you do having a good time and 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 including them and phil was more like you know just um they just thought he was he that just, guy he, he was just that mm. guy you know and, Whoever and played. uh and it's so funny the way he you know he had this incredible range as a as a in, in you know i mean like you could do a million voices and but you you were always kind of light. You know what I mean, Dana? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Dana no, I, just left. I do think that for oh, no. me, there's still, I had a stand-up thing where you had to kill to keep the job. Spade would come in, he'd crush, right. I'd have to top him. And so then... <laughs> but there was always like the playful light energy. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I knew in stand-up in these rowdy bars at midnight right. that you had to... Right win them over and make them really happy and yes. so yeah. it, at least the way i did it but uh yeah yeah and phil and i were a great combo uh along with kevin everyone had a different we we did have a, a nice assortment pack when, when we came in with phil yeah. yes but phil would like just throw himself into every role and he would play incredibly uh cheerful superficial hello fellas <laughs> yeah. type yeah. of guys yeah. like you know <laughs> Like Peter Graves is one of my favorite <laughs> sketches in, in all those years uh, at SNL that I was at. That's still one of my favorite What was favorite the take sketches. on that? And Phil, oh, Phil wrote, wrote it. it. Uh, yeah, the Discover sketch where he, you remember Phil, Peter Graves? Oh, I remember Graves, that, yeah. Uh, he was for anybody who's over 60 like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peter Graves hosted a show called oh, Discover yeah. on yeah. PBS. And then Phil did it. And, uh, and Phil played this cheerful kind of uh robotically uh you know uh clueless peter graves and and he wrote them himself and it was very deadpan and it was but then um, then he could turn on a dime and play like the mace character mace. you know the the i'm a bad crazy... bad apple rotten to the core uh the crazy <laughs> right. convict running from the police yeah. yeah 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 like he could be really scary yeah. you know if he had if he had if he had been able to have a, a long movie career i'm sure he would have played oh, just dark dark heavy roles guy, yeah. just as well as as he would have played funny roles yeah alec baldwin observed that too that he was like just a really good actor um and and then yeah. i'm just gonna jump ahead for a second because probably the, the sketch where he was the most overtly besides helmet where he played the pathetic Hans and Franz punch bag, <laughs> um, which was yes. so great and, and overtly funny, but he played it flat real, almost, almost, it was almost sad, even, even in the context of- Yes, just sort of uh, resigned to doing whatever Hans and Franz will yeah. say about him or, you know. And another yes. one, um, and this, this one, of course, you uh, wrote on a tremendous amount, uh, was him doing Ed McMahon was like the most overt oh. overt comic character, even though he was playing it real. It was just such a great take on it. So talk to Ed, his Ed. 
<laughs> yeah, his head. That was actually closer to a caricature than almost anything. That's what I, I saw thought. It was the most overtly the funny thing he yeah. ever, ever did. <laughs> because he only had like three words to say in the whole sketch. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> you are correct sir i mean he just uh, so so i think he had so little to work with on one level that he he let himself he permitted himself to play a little bit. a little funny and, and, yeah 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 and it was it was actually a funny role reversal because your johnny carson was probably as in the pocket as you've ever been in terms of like a straight sticking, man yeah. in terms of sticking to the you know integrity of yeah, Johnny Carson's that, delivery. That, I couldn't agree more. That was the first time I was in a character. I wasn't trying to get laughs, and I knew it was so funny how sincere and earnest Johnny was in that role when he yeah. was a talk show. Those you don't know, and I, where you're listening to, and then right. I would set it up kind of real and straight, and maybe the nerds at home would be laughing at that, and then he would, yeah, he would yes. release all the comic tension in the sketch. <laughs> yeah yeah so he it was a wonderful any energy mm -hmm. he was like in spades famous one of my favorite spade sketches was the the receptionist where he came in as jesus christ and he couldn't get past the receptionist and and you are and phil was just so perfectly placid mm -hmm. and yeah you know sincere uh, calm sincere and calm and then mm -hmm. on, like i said on a dime he could be incredibly dark one of the most uh, successful sketches I ever wrote for Phil and I had I, by I wrote I mean like other writers helped me Downey Franken mm -hmm. Meyer but Spain. it was the Reagan sketch where he was the uh, mastermind Reagan mastermind. mastermind behind the scenes yeah, yeah which was a parody of the way everybody else was playing Reagan as you know the senile doddering thing it just ain't well. felt so easy that I thought it'd be <laughs> funny to and it was just a perfect use of Phil it turned out because he had that range where he's just he played charming, doddering Reagan at the beginning of the sketch, and then he gets really dark and serious running the show. Yeah, speaking foreign, uh, language, cl speaking foreign languages, doors. and all, all that stuff he could do. Dialects, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> just, just rattling off. Well, all his buddy, you were buddy. Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, you were Jimmy Stewart, and then he had to play a different energy where he's trying to like get you out of the room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's like, and he, Jimmy he was, was he, a perfect foil for that because he was so, so slow. And so, you know, well, yeah, just not, taking his time. Slow <laughs> yeah. and completely clueless. Yeah. Just, and, and Reagan's just like, yes, well, Jimmy, I, I think we, it's, yeah. I just have some things to do and that yeah. kind of thing. And then, and then he finally snaps on you. <laughs> and then Stewart gets mad at him, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah Why? Well, I, I think so. Yeah. You he says, Jimmy, don't make me have to kill you. I yeah. think he says. It yeah. <laughs> don't make me have to kill you. You've changed, Dutch. You've changed. I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, God, yeah, it makes me miss you know, Bill so much when we talk Smigel, about Smigel, in one of those, when you said the receptionist sketch, I just remember, I think there was a line where Jesus is not getting mad that he can't get in, but he's a little frustrated. So for Phil, who's playing it almost nothing, he gets a laugh off of just quietly going, listen, friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, You can tell he's That's really getting That's his boiling pissed. point, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's like as angry as Jesus can permit yeah. himself to be. Yeah, that was, that that slight, was a fantastic passive, moment. aggressive, like a yeah. tiny He got move. a huge laugh. He got a yeah, huge yeah, laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you can tell. You're like, you're giving him something and he gets... Every ounce out of it, every yeah. possible laugh it could get. That was amazing. That was an amazing moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The thing about Phil, um, too, is like, uh, you know, I tend to be get enfranchised probably, luckily, in some of yours, McLaughlin Group, I guess we did a couple times, and then he, I'm leading to yes. Phil, which uh, really was, is the McLaughlin Group, because the turn of Sinatra. Oh, the Sinatra Group. Yeah. I always, yeah, I mean- we had done the McLaughlin group just a few <laughs> months earlier, I think. And yeah. it was like one of my favorite things I've ever yeah. written. It great. still is. No, it was. Oh, it was, yeah. it was fab Again, so fun I to wrote play. means that Conan or Bob helped me with it. But, but, but then, yeah, I just thought it would be funny. Like the Turners had written for, uh, Frank for Phil as Frank yeah. Sinatra. Mm -hmm. They wrote a really funny thing between you as George Michael, I believe. Yes. It was inspired. Remember Frank Sinatra, wrote an editorial in the LA times or something <laughs> mm -hmm. lecturing George Michael about how he's blowing it. Oh, that, uh, look that at was, my butt. Yeah. And then it turned into the Turners wrote a really funny back and forth between the two of you. Oh, okay. And then I wrote 
this I had the idea for the Sinatra group and I I wrote it with Terry Turner and and Downey and uh, yeah again and that what was interesting about that is that Phil the Sinatra family didn't like it I guess <laughs> oh well what was the 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 classic line I, I got chunks stuff. of guys bigger I, I got chunks of guys like you in my stool yeah yeah when he's threatening uh Billy Idol, Billy Idol. everyone was funny Sting is Billy Idol was it Jan Hooks is <laughs> Sinead yeah and is Sinead yeah yeah and who was the other one? Uh, Steve and Edie were Mike Myers and Victoria. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Chris Rock was Luther Campbell. And, oh, that's and Frank right. Sinatra just kept saying, I can't understand the word. Can't understand the word. Pops and whistles. Word. Yeah, it's all pops and buzzes from here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, an occasional <laughs> so clicking sound. Yeah, man. Yeah, but but my God, yeah, he just, uh, he, he, he was just a... Uh, like a freight train in that scene oh my god yeah but then yeah he could just go from that to and have you had on like jack handy because he wrote so many great things for well film. we've like, talked a lot about unfrozen caveman lawyer um which is oh fun god. to talk about and of course that's uh, quintessential jack handy it's quintessential phil too it's that phil. super silly yeah. kind of i'm i'm but a caveman phil. your phil ways confuse me. Just, <laughs> yeah yeah oh my god no one else could have played that part honestly like in the whole world i don't think anyone else could have been as funny. no that that is kind of one of his frequencies that kind of guy that that tone yeah it's not yeah. quite charles yeah, yeah. Heston, <laughs> he that was fellas, fellas he's Just a little funny, higher yeah that phony, kind of yeah. like yeah like fake uh fake friendly phony guy he did it you know where he was really funny in uh which is one of the f funniest insanely stupid movies ever is uh jingle all the way the schwarzenegger <laughs> yeah, movie yeah, yeah. sinbad have you seen yeah i don't know have you seen phil phil is so funny in that he, play, he, he just plays sort of a creepy phony neighbor <laughs> uh and uh but yeah unfrozen caveman lawyer and Robot also the simpsons repair. he plays that a lot oh troy mcclure yeah, yeah. Well, this that was like one of his when he auditioned or when he did his he did a comedy album before oh. he was on saturday night live huh. uh, what was it called flat tv and he played he had a few kind of uh characters like that there too like spokesman he he loved playing the uh the phony kind of mm -hmm. spokesman you know he did he had fake commercials in there his brother once approached me we were going to try to animate his um you know his uh his comedy album but never got that done we were gonna it's another thing i'm never gonna oh, do oh the two sammies <laughs> oh boy <laughs> don't get me started we didn't know what we were but doing. enough about us. but enough about um, uh but yeah but yeah he um yeah and then he could step in and just grab an impression and make it work like andy griffith i was just thinking about do you remember that one dana where it was like corbin burnson with oh corbin burnson show i remember that one yeah i remember conan i think my, or greg daniels show. had the uh, they must have had the idea it was about Nobody people cares. who play lawyers on tv mm -hmm. um all representing some guy but they're just actors and they're incapable of doing anything but carrying the you know the gravitas of being a lawyer yeah. without knowing anything and then <laughs> the, and then phil had like a cameo as andy griffith and it's just it's just unbelievably funny uh for like literally 15 seconds just that it was the uh andy griffith of the um ritz cracker era <laughs> that Andy Cracker, <laughs> the good mm, cracker, mm. yeah, yeah. Oh, good I cracker, <laughs> good crackers. But yeah, oh my God, uh, he, he did. I remember the Clinton one. Remember the Clinton one where he's oh, walking, God. he's walking around. He's kind of fat, and he's in McDonald's, and it's me. Yes, and McDonald's. It's really everybody. It was maybe that's the classic Clinton sketch where he keeps taking food from everybody <laughs> yeah. as he's interviewing, <laughs> as he's as he's glad handing everybody. That was Franken and Dave Mandel wrote that, but it was. um yeah, that was that was the peak of his Clinton. But I remember the first time he did Clinton, the audience went insane. It was like oh. he was he was again because he could capture that kind of fake um, you know, smart me like quality. Ability. Yeah. Yeah, like he I just I remember pain, like you know, kind of stuff. He, he was like the last guy in a in a debate sketch and he came on as Clinton and the audience just lit up right away. He had he had the, you know, uh the smile going and it, yeah. almost before he spoke, he had captured the essence of how people perceived Clinton at that time. He also played Donald Trump. 
people yes. forget. Mm-hmm. He was he was like the first guy who played Donald Trump. He did it on your church chat, I remember. He, he did it numerous yeah. times. Um his Jimmy Swagger was really funny because it was the story oh, of yeah, the week. He, and Jimmy Swagger he played a lot. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, he played a lot of evangelists. On well, your the year show. of church <laughs> chat, just a character I had, whatever, Rosie Schuster and I, she came up with, let's put it in a talk show. But right. we and then all these uh, religious scandals. Like Jim Baker. Yeah, Jim, Jim Baker, Baker with Jim, and Jimmy Swaggart. And Jimmy Swaggart. Um, yeah. And he played Saddam Hussein on there, which was John Goodman <laughs> dressed as the church ladies. There were, there were two of us. And then we beat the hell out right. of him. It was like a five minute fight scene <laughs> with oh my God. karate. Pun. But he played it so real and so straight. Uh, that, was this during this was this during the Iraq war? Must have been like the or, first or one, even the, the beginning the of it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Wow. And we talked That's about amazing. how he could make his eyes go dead when he was playing sort of a villain he, like Alec Guinness. Is that the actor? Right. Oh, yeah. Just the, the Phil could make his eyes go dead, which was fascinating to watch. But um, yeah, there's so many one off sketches because you tend to remember franchises, you know, like coffee yeah. talk or right. whatever it, at Wayne's world. And then Phil had so many one-off sketches with one, what he was hosting. I don't, uh, and it was, um, an acting teacher. This is something, this is nothing. Oh, this is when he hosted. Yeah. Yes. And that was his own character. That was a character he created. And I understand that it's according to John Lovitz. It's literally exactly based on some acting, you know, where he's dropping all these third rate, um, credits yeah. about this guy yes yes <laughs> was on yeah. maddox for two seasons and you know what i remember that yeah it, maddox. It, to- it totally killed i was like where was this character all these years yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are because, you holding out because phil always wanted to have like he 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 had this kind of i remember he took a lot of pride in the fact that he had a lot of one-offs and that he could step into anything and mm-hmm. that he approached the show as an actor but there was, I remember, like the rare times where he had a hit recurring character, like the anal retentive chef. Yes. Sure. Another thing Bonnie and Terry, Bonnie and Terry. created. Uh, he would get really excited. Like, yeah, and Mace. You know, he wrote Mace. He put Mace through read through a couple times, right? He, Mace. And then, and then Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer became like the. Oh, that's the, huge. The, the what about, one, remember yeah. Sassy Magazine? Sassy, yeah. Mandel, again, created that toward the end. Uh, Cause we were always uh, in those cause it was always young guys and sassy. Sassy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great one. <laughs> I wrote one that, um, that he absolutely killed in. And then I never brought it back, which was the Matthew Modine drill sergeant. You remember oh, that yeah. guy? Oh yeah. Saw that. Yeah. Who couldn't remember. He didn't, he didn't know how to give me nicknames to people. Like the, yeah. it was like a parody of full metal jacket. And, uh, yeah, you're, the, uh, you're called, uh, you know, Mr. Smiling, laughing, joking around, yeah. man. Mr. Like talking after <laughs> that guy, guy. You know, it yeah, got more yeah, and more yeah. awkward and, and ridiculous. Right. Yeah. And he just he just played it so brilliant. Played it scary. Because he, yeah. Because he could play it scary, but then he understood exactly how to be awkward with it as he was yeah. stumbling. And what about uh, what this one? The, uh, There's the caller there. What? Phil Donahue. Oh my God! Yeah, Phil Donahue. Boy, so did great. he murder with that one! Murder. Yeah, right away. Like that was another one that was. Uh, was that even in his audition, or did he just learn that when he? I don't remember it in his audition, show? but yeah, I don't think it was. I think he just learned it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's the funniest impression to exaggerate it and just get the. the oh yeah! The, 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 oh my the, God! You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That you was another must one be where he... thinking that you know what you're doing all the time. You know, it's that. Yeah. You come home from work and you put your stuff down and you're thinking I'm the greatest guy. And <laughs> everything he said it. was funny, no matter what. <laughs> Unbelievable. And yet he would never. The, and then I remember that the one time. Did he ever break more than once? The, the more whole? than Frankenstein? That Frankenstein? That's the Frankenstein. only time I remember anyone breaking. We were terrified of breaking. That's true. You guys later. weren't allowed to break back then. No, we weren't. The, the fear of no, being fired. It, but Phil did it break. Wasn't, it wasn't the ending like it is on some. <laughs> <laughs> Basic, yeah. It's insurance now. It's an insurance policy now. Then we break and uh, go to commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine Lauren reading that in the stage direction. <laughs> Someone could put that in. <laughs> Horatio breaks. 
Mm. Uh, <laughs> Time for a break. Like, Rachel, Cut to G.E. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel suppresses a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy can't stop giggling. Go to camera two. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. Oh, man. We're just like calling out these hits, but, I, yeah. but it's fun. Um, totally. Bade, how did you, did you ever feel like, did you ever have moments with Phil where you got to know him that well? You know, we were such uh, a different generation. Yeah. He was super friendly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's funny because people say SNL so tough, which it is, but no one's not really friendly. Uh, you know, everyone's sort of just in their own world surviving. So right. it's taken as everyone's so icy and cold, but no, it, it, no. Phil was just, you know, Phil wasn't always writing. And so a lot of the problem with, most people wrote, so they're locked in the room, stressed, trying to write them out. Yeah. And so that's taken as like, you guys, nobody wants to play kickball. So, uh, <laughs> so with Phil, you walk by and he's reading something. Painting. And he's like, hey, right. what's going on in Spades world? <laughs> so, and his office you know, was, was what, fastidious. It was beautifully. Yeah, yes. I would admit it this week. Uh, he was so, one of the most fun. relaxed people in the staff, on the staff, writer or performer, or, or because he, partly because he never, was i mean the show always needed him he was always in like seven sketches every he was almost episode. like a host every week you know <laughs> that's why i don't know if i came up with it or you or jan hooks but some at some point he was nicknamed the glue for this very reason because he was so oh yeah uh, essential to the, the show every show oh, why i'm thinking it was it, it wasn't farley farley just said it the most Blue. I think you're the glue. Oh, glue. Oh. Uh, the glue. <laughs> glue. <laughs> glue sounds good. Hi, glue. Hi, <laughs> glue. I don't know who came up with it, but I, Jan had her own language with Phil. They were like, you know, like Lovitz was like his little brother, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, is Lovitz going to be at the. Yeah, yeah. he's right. That, that was him that just called. He's going oh, good. Over right yeah, he's, he's got to be there. And the other person who I wish could be there is Jan because nobody. Right had that she had such a connection yes. with them they were like they were almost like comedy twins you know they had, like who had their own language you know they had nick they, i think of it because they had their own nicknames for each other she would like cinnamon and uh sandy he, he would hello sandy hello cinnamon it was that kind yeah. of yeah when they, jan comes up on on this particular always. podcast we you know we love to throw her some light too cuz she was such a brilliant um, yeah. Yes. Oh, without a doubt. And um, yeah, but the two of them were really like uh, they they just partnered up in so Ginger many. Ginger Rogers scenes. and Fred Astaire, might I say? <laughs> might you? You might. They you were might in very sync. Well, in sync. think about think about saying that. Think about saying that. You might. It say feels it. good when I say it, and I think of them in a sketch together, riding a wave together in, <laughs> in sync, both giving and taking. Perfectly. They were like Nancy Reagan and Phil, and uh, she played Nancy, and uh, they were Hillary and Bill, and uh, yeah. yeah, they did. But they did so many other things too, and like on church chat, she was always like the the woman that he was that the the evangelist was uh, was screwing over. It never or, got louder or, or than when she did the Tammy Faye Baker that week. It oh my never god, got bigger uh, laughs yeah. that I'd ever heard. Yeah, that was you know? that was amazing. That was but amazing. The two of them. Oh, you know what they called themselves? Clydesdales. That's what oh. I remember. Yeah, because they were Show like, ponies. or maybe that was probably, it sounds like a Jan nickname because she was mm -hmm. like, they're the show ponies. And then me and Phil are the Clydesdales who like are, are like carrying the load kind of thing. When I say that to women, <laughs> they get offended at that compliment. <laughs> hey by the way dana lovitz is here i gotta jump off and love all him right yeah oh. yeah stall him i'll be there in a few yeah, minutes okay. i'll just talk okay. i'll say goodbye Smigel, Robert. thanks for say, talking you got it bud this next guest is not our favorite um <laughs> he begged to be on we didn't have any room but we said all that's right that's a lie <laughs> <laughs> no it's john lovitz of course and who is probably the closest with phil he, John, felt he couldn't come to the live show because he would get too emotional. And so he came on with us and um, we let it bounce all over the place. It, it, we have a lot of fill, but it goes a lot of different places. Here's John. Our guest today is actor, comedian, extraordinaire, singer. John Lovitz, and a great singer, probably mm -hmm. the best singer of a cast member on Saturday Night Live. I, is anyone else sing like you, John? Jan Hooks. 
Jenga yeah, belt. And a ga- gas. Well, the women. Yeah, I was going for yeah. the men, though. Every I, woman I is say, I she's see like you a as a professional man. singer. Anna oh, Anna. Anna, yeah. She goes on Sandler. Broadway. She Sandler, has albums. Sandler's a great singer. Yeah. Oh, he did Opera Man with you. So maybe we yeah, need to Yeah, but he can. You can belt it. Sing, yeah. Yeah. He can he can rock. Be He's got a great voice. Yeah. He's a rocker. You. So. Yeah. All I have is chopping broccoli. Great drummer. Chicha. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's really singing. And cold as ice. So Phil was in that sketch. I watched it the other night because I I look at my sketches late at night. <laughs> yeah, show your wife. Know, yeah, yeah, that sketch. If you, he 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 did that move a lot where he's listening to music and he's, he's just kind of like, moving. Yeah, head. <laughs> was Real he an subtle, guy? Very funny. So it was the most absurd. It was a good shot by I guess Paul Miller, the director. Who was anyway, the director? who was the director Pando back then, Phil. John? Do you Paul, know? Paul, my first year was Paul. My oh. first year, well, I was on the year before you in 85. It was uh, Dave now. Oh, Dave, uh, Davey Wilson. Dave yeah. Wilson. Yeah, but yeah, my, that first Nelson. year, I think Davey came back, called him Davey, but I think it was Paul. He was there Miller. two years, and then Paul yeah. was there, I think, the next year. Yeah, three. yeah. But anyway, Phil had this incredibly funny take, and that was the end of the first show that I did with, with Phil. We came in together, you know. I remember when Phil and I met you for the first time at uh and you already knew Phil. gray's yeah. offices yeah the, and w- you were very nice and then we didn't know i didn't know you at all neither did phil but we met you and then you left and then phil and i said or maybe we left but we said oh i hope that guy gets the show he's so nice you're welcome yeah, did was, I do any characters nice or anything? I was no, just... you were just so nice and phil and i just liked you right away well the way i remember it, it then, you know the you. three of us became great friends we really were the three musketeers, and with Dennis, a qu- quartet of musketeers, Kevin. You, but Phil, just to, just for our listeners, so John is um, an alumni, an illustrious alumni from the Groundlings, along with a lot of people, and you knew Phil from the Groundlings, and you knew how brilliant he was. Yeah, when I when I got to the Groundlings. There was four people in the company that were like the stars. Of the, we, you know, we thought of them as stars. It was Phil and Tim Stack. And then the women were Tress McNeil, does a lot of voices on Simpsons forever. And um, Lynn Stewart, who was in Pee Wee's Playhouse, mm-hmm. Miss Yvonne. And Paul, Ro- Paul Rubens was uh, Pee Wee Herman. He invented Pee Wee Herman at the Groundlings. And I saw him there in 81. And then I went back five years later. So, but... When I got back in, Pee Wee's already big in movies, mm-hmm. and, and Phil was like the king of the Groundlings, and everybody looked up to him. He was the only guy in the group. He had a house, he had a new car, he had a job. The rest of us were dead broke. Was he doing voiceover Which work and stuff or guest spots? He was on a things? graphic artist. <clears throat> His brother John uh, was a music manager of like um, the group America, you know, Horse with No Name. Mm-hmm. And I asked John, how did you know, Phil do this. He said, well, I just went to him and said, I need an album cover for America's Greatest Hits. And Phil drew this something. He goes, you mean something like this? And John looked at it and said, something like this, this. And that's oh. the cover. He was a graphic designer. I, I don't know, know what his the, training. He was a- I'm going to bring those to the- They're room. online. Yeah, we Crosby, should, we Still, should. and Nash logo. That's Phil. Yeah. He got it all from- His brother was managing all these groups. Poco. Um, mm-hmm. Poco. So he could- but He was just- and he do voiceover stuff too. Commercial. Someone sent me something recently where he was doing commercials for somebody, doing voices. Yeah, he could just do it. He he was um he got in the Groundlings. He was at a a birthday party there, and there was an intermission in the show, and all the um, actors are backstage, and they hear all this laughter coming from the theater during intermission, and they they go, "Who? What's going on?" And they walk out, and Phil's on stage entertaining everybody. And, oh, they, the and they just said, you want to be in the group? He's like, sure. I mean, he was, you know, he was like that. He was, um, one time at SNL, I was walking to his office. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm reading a magazine about fly fishing. Yeah. Oh. And then three weeks later, I walk in his office. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm making flies. Three weeks later, he's got a full kit yeah. making flies that you fish with. Oh, you know, yeah. And, My dad And making used to them that. perfect. And I go... And he would just immerse himself in something. Fun, yes, you know, I walk and then by once. Move he goes, on to the next. I'm thing. gutting a lunker bass. Want to help? I go, Phil. We have a show in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, look up lunker bass. I'm making antelope jerky. I forgot you were Grab here. Grab 
a machete. He would skin a I mean, bear <laughs> at the. He would skin a bear in the mountains and make coats out of it, uh, with little kind John, of John. Are you a medium? Buttons. If but he I, wanted, he could. He could do that. <laughs> no, I know he, he was became a pilot. Like I flew with him a lot to a. Then he bought a plane. Then I flew with him to Catalina mm-hmm. a couple of times. And uh, well, one time I did. One time I flew with him. I forget where, but anyway, he became whatever he was doing. So when we got in this plane, he starts talking to the tower on the radio, mm-hmm. and he sounded like a pilot from United Airlines. Yeah, his whole demeanor changed. Yeah. It wasn't just oh, a, yeah, it wasn't funny. Phil talking to you. It was the pilot. <laughs> this is nine or this. This. this is nine. Yeah, just like you this know, is American too. And heavy. when he got on his boat, he was like uh, Mr. Sa- it just disappeared. He got yeah, he meticulous he, into his boat stuff. He would he was surfing in his twenties. So if you talked about surfing, he'd say, oh yeah, man, that's going all right. And mm-hmm. Just he became the character. Tom Maxwell is the director of the Growling said. One time Phil drove up to the Groundlings and he was wearing a, a in a truck and a cowboy outfit. And he was just like a complete cowboy. Just because he has a truck? He just got into <laughs> and it. And just started talking like, cowboy, po- what you fellas fixing to do? Good show. Used, I used to go to his house and he would play, he played guitar, right? So one time he was imitating a, a, a black blues player, but a guy that was like in his 80s. And, and just, it was just hysterical, you know, and he's just playing. And, what do you want him, funny boys? Can we go back to the, that? Origin thing. We can go because, back to whatever you want, Dana. Uh, because it's it leads show. to a clip. I have a method of my madness. But uh, Do you have a so clip? I think an audio clip of uh, goes back to the origin of coming to Saturday Night Live and meeting Phil and Jan and yourself and everybody in those weeks before yeah. me. Weeks weeks before we would go downtown. We go. What was the club? The Bottom Line. We went down there and saw Buster Poindexter. So it was very otherworldly. Oh. And then you and Phil. Had this connection where Dinah Minot, our producer, you guys would go back and forth with the gangster 40s voices. Hey, what are you doing here? Yeah. Well, what, yeah, that <laughs> like was, forever. You guys would go for hours. Well, I was like 18, and I remember I'd watch these old movies and I'd say to my mom, I go, Why do they talk like that? So if I was like, Hi, Charlie, how you doing? Good to see you. What's going on? Nothing. And you. <laughs> and then or the phone would ring. I'm pretty good. How are you? Hang on, the phone's ringing. Oh, hello. <laughs> and I thought it was so funny. Well, it is. And then in the groundlings, in 1984, the uh, Olympics was in Los Angeles, so they had an o- Olympic art festival, and and uh, they funded, gave money to nine equity waiver theaters, meaning is 99 seats or less. So if you're in the actors' union, you could perform in a theater that had 99 seats or less. So anyway, they mm-hmm. gave money to nine of these, and the Growlings was one, and they picked, um, and, oh, and they gave money to do a show, but it had to have the theme of the Olympics in it. So they picked. Uh, Phil, he did a character, Chick Hazard, which was a That's right. satire of like Humphrey Bogart, you know, Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe. There Marlo was like and, he of those legs. He went up like a monkey boy looking for coconuts. coconuts or yeah. what, right? Is that? So they picked Shh. that and I got to understudy it. And that's how I got, he, he re, had recommended me. So I was so grateful. I was like, I remember the first time I met him, he's walking down the hallway with like looking like Humphrey Bogart with the trench coat and hat. And I, and he goes, hi, John. I go, I go, no, I, and I, no, I saw him. I go, I go, hey, Phil, uh, I'm John Lovejoy. Yeah, John, I know who you are. I go, you do? Oh, yeah. I go, well, thanks for recommending me to understudy this party. He goes, oh, yeah, I think you'll be fantastic. And he was such a b- big star there. In my head, I m- remember thinking, oh, my God, Phil Hartman spoke to me. Like, I didn't know him at all. He was like a legend there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just It would be like, you know, like Keenan Thompson on SNL. And he's been mm-hmm. there 20 years and you get the show. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! There's Keenan. He was like a host. It was like that when hosts talk to you. Yes, huge. Did you so then I was he had here? a house. I go. I want to see your house. And he had me over to a little house in the valley. And he said, "You know, you're the first person from the Groundlings I've ever had over to my house." I'm like, "What? You're kidding? Hmm. You've never had anyone over?" He goes, "No, I why?" He goes, "I'm very private, you know." Oh, this is a good thing. When he got SNL. Uh, he turned it down. He goes, I don't want to be famous. I like my life. I kept wanting to recommend him. And Phil and Lawrence said, my second year, he said, we want, want, we want to know people you work well with. Or Dinah Minot said that's producer. Mm-hmm. So I recommended Phil and Tim and Lynn and Tress. And, um, and Lawrence said, well, John, how long has Phil been in the Groundlings? And I said, 10 years. He goes, and he still hasn't made it. There must be a reason why. I cool. said, yeah, I guess. Because I was saying, I said to Lauren, look, if you think I'm good, I go, you love Phil. He's a genius. You know, I looked, he was nine years older and mm-hmm. he became like my big brother and I looked up to him and 
Kind of how you, Dana, looked up to me when you got the show. I'm nervous right now. Yeah, me too. I know you both are. Do you mind if I call you dad? No, I just want to say to both of you, I don't blame you for being nervous. You're only human. You know, <laughs> is, this is a video remember, tape, but I'm sitting I, on John's I'm, lap. I'm just a person. <laughs> yeah, you are. There's no camera no, right not, now, but I'm, I'm doing a handstand in joy that John's here on the table. David? Yeah. But when I say I'm just a person, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> I'm not just a person. Yeah. So, so um. Anyway, so that so the Phil was always doing that '40s things, and I mm -hmm. loved old movies, and I'd done an improv, so we would always do it back and forth. We loved old movies, and I didn't realize <clears throat> when he auditioned, he had his audition. I think the same day as you mm -hmm. and Jim Carrey, right? Yeah. Tomorrow. Jim. So, I, so um. Yeah, and the, some guy, the siren went off in the yes. middle of your audition, and Jim Carrey, some guy was jumping off a building at NBC in Burbank. And, but anyway, if you watch our audition, at one point, Lauren goes, John, go up there. And Phil and I started doing those lines, and I didn't realize how much of them ended up in the sketch. So about three years later, so I said, Phil, we're always doing the 40s things. Let's write a sketch. So right. I had the idea that I was the head of a studio, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was a... You know, movie star playing a, a World War II yeah. pilot. Yeah. And now the war's over, but he's just gone crazy. He actually, he's gotten carried away with his part and I have to fire him. But then we we wrote the sketch together. And so let's let's hear that now. Cause that was, you guys did it on one oh, of you the have first it? show or maybe the first few shows. What's so good? I don't know. We did it. We would have been there about three years or four years. I By said, the time you did this? I said, yeah. I said, well, oh. I go, we're always doing it. Let's write a sketch of it. So we wrote it. Okay. And Phil, by the way, Phil, I'm just saying, he said to me, he goes, this was his favorite sketch of any sketch that he did. Well, you guys were in such sync. Let's, so let's, let's, like, let's take a so listen. We good. learned our lines. If you have made too many of these war movies, <laughs> maybe I should take a rest, huh, Harry? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Johnny. I think you should take a rest too, a permanent one. What do you mean? I'm letting you go. You mean? Yes, your contract isn't being renewed. But Harry, I... You're finished, Johnny. Don't mince words. I think you stink. <laughs> Listen, Harry, if you're unhappy with my work, tell me now. You're through. Do you hear me? Through. You'll never work in this town again. Don't leave me hanging by a thread. Let me know where I stand. <laughs> I think you're the worst actor I've ever seen, and I get 500 letters a day telling me the same. What's the word on the street? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was, you know, both the you funniest guys part so great when that. that sketch was when he goes, he goes, I'm, uh, I'm don't leave me hanging. I'm sorry, Harry. He goes, is it the pills? No, the booze? No, the sheep? The goats? No, no. Your wife? No. What? Huh? What? <laughs> Stop it. Get out. <laughs> the funny, just the, the sheep, the goats? No, no. What about, <laughs> what about the one where Dana, I think you're People robbing something. What? I'm sorry. Oh, David's I'm here too. I know, I'm sorry. You're in feelings too. I was in the middle of a sentence. Mm, he was, you know, sort get of, off, you know what, David? I'm sort of whining Get off now. my lap. <laughs> now, what do you want to ask? Now, hang on, let me crawl back to my chair. Uh, when he goes, I think Dana was a uh, robbing like a 50s malt yeah. shop. And he goes, you're the man, Johnny. No one's going to hurt you. And Dana's like, okay, I'll blow her head off. He's like, you're the man, Johnny. No one's gonna. You know, it was like a cop talking you down. Do you remember this? Um, is oh, that, that's not the one. There was one where I had a catchphrase. That was Steve Gutenberg show. I tried to land this catchphrase. Why I ought to pound you? Yeah, we did a spoof of the movie The Front Page. Yeah, but that was my catchphrase, and Lauren thought I think it could catch on. Why yeah. I, why, I I remember. Yeah. Why I, I ought to pound you? <laughs> holding up a fist. <laughs> no, it was great though. They talk like that, and and the. That sketch, one more mission. I, Phil's humor. I'm. I didn't think it was that funny, but because sorry, Harry, I let you down. You've always been like a father to me. And I went, oh Johnny, Johnny, oh Johnny, Johnny. He thought that was the funniest thing. In the sketch. <laughs> I'm like that. It is but, funny. By the way, your dog's some... biting everyone. But he could do. Uh, I remember in his audition, you can see it online. He. Uh, he would, you know, could do impressions. So he he did it at, at the Groundlings. He did uh, he did it too as a a talk show, a German talk show host, Gunter something, and the, and he's all gibberish German. And then he would impersonate Jack Benny in German, mm -hmm. and John Wayne in German, and Jack Nicholson in German. And I mean, he could do everything. He did that on his audition, I believe. Yeah, yeah. and and the weird thing though, when he was on the show, 
he never did. He really didn't do any of his characters that he he did in the Groundlings. And I, I kept saying, why don't you do it? He only did Chick Hazard once. Mm, really? And that was in a sketch that I had done was the, the Eddie Spumoso, the, the gangster. Mm -hmm. He only did it once. He wouldn't do his characters. I go, why don't you do them? He goes, no, I'm saving it for my own show. And he was supposed to do his own show after SNL. He had a deal. The sketch show? Yeah, the purple. That would be I tough. I forget what it's called. You The purple something. And it, it, it has, like and a prime time? Happen. He was very disappointed. Like a different network or? No, at NBC, but his own show. Prime time then. Because I heard when I was yeah. leaving, or he was he still was there when you guys left. And, right? And then he said. Uh, oh, yeah. He stayed I heard he got after. a three-year maybe like $10 million deal to stay. And I was like, what? Jesus. Oh, I was like, crap. holy I shit, stayed. 10 million? You think, uh, I remember I asked him once, pay that much? I said, uh, who, who do you think's funnier between Dana and <laughs> David and I? And he said, well, John, you know, I think you know. Who'd you ask, Phil or Lauren? Phil. <laughs> I think you know. And it was me? It was me. I think you probably said John? Why I ought to pound <laughs> what? you. Johnny, what, you're are the man. you saying I just made that up just now? You're the man, Johnny. Ah, hey fellas, how you doing? So <laughs> Phil had this sort of this persona he would put on sometimes just to kind of lighten things up, that sort of high pitch. What's up? What's going on? It's fellas? like a Simpsons Keep, guy. Is that the uh, a character from The Simpsons? That's that, kind of that, that vibe. rhythm he does. Right, John? The like answer from is old yes. Movies. Well, the Simpsons, they hired him a lot. <laughs> he did a I don't know. How many characters and 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 mm -hmm. they decided you know after he passed away they were, they were gonna like not do those characters anymore because he just did him so great Tori McClure and mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of them and um, mm -hmm. but the funny thing is I when I started doing The Simpsons uh, oh. after SNL oh. and a lot of the writers there were all from had been on Saturday Night Live <laughs> who is it Conan. Well, Conan was there. The, my was Craig first, Daniels? Your, the guys that were there at first, mm -hmm. John Schwartzwelder. I don't think he was there when you guys were there. John Schwartzwelder and- George Meyer. George Meyer, yeah. And, and yeah, um, right John right Vitti. And they'd all been on SNL. Mm -hmm. And and the reason is they're all those Harvard, uh, you know, lampoon Nerds. writers. Right. They're all on The Simpsons. They're all on SNL, you know. Yeah. And Al Jean and Mike Reese who ran the- Simpsons for years, and they were, they went to Harvard Lampoon, so they knew Conan. Conan was like younger than four years younger. Mm -hmm. Al Jean's your boy. Conan was there, yeah. So, it, so I, that's one reason I think they hired it. They knew us, you know. And they go, uh, yeah, but they love Phil there. He was like, a, you know, practically a cast member on The Simpsons. John, do you think <laughs> you should lie. get paid we for can what talk you do? about The Simpsons too? <laughs> <laughs> John and I did I like a that really microscopic one. <laughs> John and I used to do this and tease each other in Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and so we wrote a sketch doing that with Robert Wagner, I believe. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, Robert Wagner. It's a teasing the rhythm. Doodaloo guys. Like it looks like someone's sketch got on the show. <laughs> it's an emphasis. <laughs> Yeah, Conan still does that every time I see him. First thing he says, doesn't say hello or anything. <laughs> anyway, uh, so John Lovitz, um, but sorry, going oh. back for just a second because it. Cause I remember that. Yeah, Phil was going to come in as a writer, and he always had a briefcase. And he was I'm, hired as a writer. Yeah, at first. and I remember you saying to me, "You don't understand. He's the greatest." You you were really pushing him to then become a cast member. So was he a feature player? Or a I think player? he was a feature player. Oh, but I was telling you, so when he got the show, uh, he, he goes, I got offered. I go, and he goes, I, he goes, I turned it down. I go, why? He goes, I, I don't want to be famous. I like my life. I don't want to do it. And then- You go, I'm the opposite. And then a, a few days ago, I, yeah, I'm the opposite. <laughs> he changed his mind. Yeah, I was the opposite. Fame <laughs> looks and, pretty uh, good on you, Jenny. Well, I, yeah, I wanted to be a performer. And, and wanted to be famous. So, so, um, well, I didn't want to just be famous for, for the me. Ladies. I wanted to be, you know, as a comedian. Dana, there's a difference. Anyway, <laughs> the point is. Thank you, John. He he then said he would, yes to the show. Yes. So I called him up because I wanted the credit and said, so Phil, you've changed your mind. You're going to do the show. I said, so did you change your mind because of me? Because I, I convinced you to believe in yourself and that's why you changed your mind. And he said, no. I'm like, 
oh. <laughs> I really wanted the credit. <laughs> and it's just goes, no. up. I go, oh, all right. Well, why did you change your mind? And he said, uh, Joel Silver. Well, Joel Silver is a big producer of like Lethal Weapon. And we'd, we'd done a movie that Penny Marshall cast us in, uh, Jumbo Jack Flash. And Joel was producing it. So I remember I kept saying to Joel, you got to meet. He, he liked, I would do the old movie stuff. I go, you got to meet my friend Phil. You're going to love him. We do this thing. So we did it. And Joel loved it because he loved old movies, you know. So I, he's, I said, what changed, when made you change your mind? He goes, Joe Silver. I go, what did he say? He said, he called me and s- said, you're crazy to turn this down. You've got to do it. But can, and that's true. That's he, it? he said, no, everyone's dying to be on the show. Dying. It's like the biggest career break of your life. And, and he turned it down. Down. Yes. <laughs> and, and he turned it down. And he turned it down. And he turned it down. Down. Speaking, all right, we're on John You know, it's interesting to me. What's interesting to know? This is why you guys look up to me. Immediately, you're 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 imitating me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's just how I talk. I'm not trying to talk like that. But when I emphasize something, it comes off like that. Balderdash. Balderdash. Jealous. (laughs) Jealous. Hey, John, I like your (laughs) glasses. Then you put the glasses down and go, jealous. Jealous. One time we were doing a a show. (laughs) William Shatner was the host. And Dana, I Dana can't came believe up, he hosted. Go ahead. Dana came up to me and goes, John, what? I'm in. Go ahead. Tell me. Well, there said. was a sketch. I think I was playing Ricardo Montalban from Wrath of Khan, of course. I had a chest plate there. <laughs> I was like, Kirk, Kirk. But then I think I went <laughs> off stage and did an off stage thing or I changed something. Well, you Some, had three sketches. Oh, I thought I did three characters in one I don't sketch. Know, John, you know I mean? I'm in three. Three. I teased him for a week about that. John, you remember how many I was in? Three. <laughs> <laughs> but we would just laugh. Ooh, John to injury I, adds a deal. It was so overtly a competition, a friendly competition. We just made fun of the whole concept. Well, we it. now you said we got to talk about it because it's the, it's I, too I, no. And that makes so fun we of did, it. and then one time we almost got uh, over deedly do. We got in a we almost got <laughs> punch. We didn't get in a fist fight, but we were really. Remember, we were I asked you, could I do it? And you go, go ahead. And then I go, why oh, don't you yeah. be mad? And then I did it. And you go, I can't believe you did it. I go, I asked you. You go, well, I was tired. And and then we got in a, in a car, big argument. And I mean, really big. Like we almost mm-hmm. started punching. Well, and I mean, we that, just stopped that talking. Happens. And then an hour later, Dana said, I'm sorry. That's I did? Nice. Yes. God, I'm I such said, a that's good right. human great I go, guy I got, syndrome. You go, I was tired. I go, well, that's why I asked you. So I, I wanted to not have this mm-hmm. happen. But did you say but sorry? But Jim Downey wrote it. I didn't write it. But Jim I, Downey John, said, by that point, I said sorry in the Hans and Franz character. I said, I'm sorry. No. I shouldn't have. But there was some sketch Jim <laughs> no. Downey wrote. And <laughs> Jim, I said, you got to ask Dana. That's his bit. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's what it was like. You know, li- uh, you come up fat. with a tiny little thing and they go, I'm going to turn it into a sketch. And, and then if someone else took it, you you know, it's like comedians stealing your jokes, your bits. Wow. You go nuts. I remember um, Get to Know Me. I went up, Danny DeVito was hosting. And uh, and I said, uh, I go, hey, Danny, you want to get a, and it, oh, he was hosting and he just done Twins. It opened a hundred million. Mm-hmm. I go, Danny, you want to get ahead in this business? Get to know me. Because I was nobody. Right. And he goes, hmm, cute. Because that was the joke. Like, you get to yeah. know yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, like, I remember, I remember, the, I remember nobody. the character. Did and you then I it? decided to write it up. I go, oh, that'll be something to write up. And I go, what am I going to name the character? Well, they said, once you're on the show, any anything you own, you made up before that, you own. But anything after that, we own. And they wouldn't pay us as writers. And they go, you're not a writer. I go, but you put my stuff on every week. It was ridiculous. Right. So so I said, well, when am I going to name the character? And I go, oh, I'll name it John Lovitz. I'll name it me. And then they can't say, if they say anything, I go, well, you didn't <laughs> That's own clever. me. Correct. They can't own you. So if you get a show. movie, ju- get to know me movie, then you get I, it. So I named it that. That was smart. You Could you give us a little bit for people who haven't yeah, seen it? Give do a little us a bit of little, a couple bars. What it would have sounded like all those years ago in eight H. You are I'm Phil Donahue, and you are something else. Let me tell you, <laughs> everybody's talking about the liar, and here you are, and you got a sketch called Get Get to Know Me. So go ahead, give us a couple lines, please. Please. Uh, hello, I'm John Lovitz. Hello, I'm John Lovitz. <laughs> Do you want to get ahead in life? Then I have one piece of advice for you. Get to know me. Get to know my likes, my dislikes. What makes me tick? What makes me me? Where's my secret freckle? Have I always had this much hair? Why do women call me the anchor? Get to know me. Now here's a letter I recently received. Dear John. 
Before I got to know you, I was nothing, nowhere, nobody. I was trying to be a performer and couldn't get hired at all. Then I got to know you. And today they call me Dana Carvey. <laughs> did, get to know me. <laughs> did you use my name in that sketch? No, just oh, you made that up. What did you Isn't say? It, I no, did this one. When's the last Dear time? John, before I got to know you, <laughs> I was nothing, nowhere, nobody. I was short with black hair, looked like everybody else. <laughs> then I got to know you. Well, I'm still short and my hair is still black. But today they call me Japan. <laughs> Japan? Japan? What does that mean? The Short and black? <laughs> I'm taking credit for the whole country. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Al Pacino. Dear John, before I got to know Still you, going. I was nothing, nor nobody. I had crooked teeth and... It's no funny one, how these nobody things come back. Do well, you... my hair is still... My teeth, I got my teeth fixed and my hair is straight. And today they call me... Queen Elizabeth. Saturn. Now, do you do the, you got to do that in your stand-up. John is That's a great funny. stand-up, plays all over the country. You should do that I've in your stand-up. I've seen her cut out all the rest and do that. <laughs> yeah. You son of a bitch bust. <laughs> you son of a bitch you bust. Got, you got always, an anchor. Phil you... and I would say that to each other. You son of a bitch bastard. No, but that stuff, you know, then you can have a, you have a solid four minutes if you do that twice. If you do that, and John, can you do, just for, for, because it's fun to, wind people up master thespian remember when we were playing vegas and, you, and someone <laughs> mentioned it and you did this little soliloquy you did a little yes can you can yes. you do that or is that hard yeah, I, I must i'll no, start you not hard. i must a thespian i'll do it i got now from the diaries of the greatest actor of all time master thespian <laughs> Thank you. And then there was the time and I had the keen insight to realize Shylock should be played as a Dane and Hamlet as a Hebrew. The theatrical community of London was so dumbfounded by what is now a well-known fact. They begged me to perform my version of the melancholy Jew before the queen herself. To be or not to be? Oi, what a question. Well, you can imagine the response, but for those of you who can't, here it is. Master Thespian, this is Laurence Olivier. Teach me to act. This is John Gilgood. Teach me to act. This is Prince Philip. Go fuck yourself. And so I did. I taught them all. Olivier, Gilgood, Guinness, O'Toole, Schwarzenegger. Oh, yes. All those muscles he has. Acting. By God, the man's a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so oh no you got two bits for your stand up you should do get to know Dude, me I tried doing that stuff when I started doing stand up and it didn't work it will work now John because you're so much more no confident. but I do I do uh, no you do it like these are from Saturday Night Live you well, set I it could, up well I could but the, what I've done made me laugh which really works <laughs> and I think you would agree I said okay. I go, hi I'm John Lovitz you know I just saw my friend David Spade the other day and I saw a stand up act and I think it went something like this. And, <laughs> and then you do, you my do act. his I best do his whole jokes. act. Mm -hmm. And then I do the same thing with you, Dana. And what did you do after the and standing ovation? I go, oh, I saw my friend Dana Carver the other day. I saw a stand up act. He was really good. And I think it went something like this. And you and do then it? I just do your act. Saves a lot well, I have a, of time I have a writing a whole bit. Act. I do. It's called Sorry. You <laughs> Used to Know Me. You Used to Know Me, but not anymore. I'm Danagani. You Used to Know Me. Is it too close to get I don't to think know me? So. Oh, okay. I used to have a character, Temple Woman. Temple Woman? That, well, that's, is that kind of like church? Lady? I don't see any Well, she goes, well, isn't that special? You're what in church. You she's in temple. You're a lady. So this is a woman. What's her catchphrase? <laughs> hmm? What's isn't her catchphrase? that unusual? Mine is. Well, isn't that something? Well? <laughs> <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> oh, my well, stomach! Isn't that special? I think Jerry farted. And then didn't you do? You did something. I thought it was like the liar, but the fibber. The fibber. Yeah, I had the fibber. Fibber McGee. <laughs> I uh, I had a dog fought in my face. Yeah, that's 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 the platform. Oh, then you, David. I yeah. remember I did a sketch. The richest Mr. Camby, the richest man in the world, but he was an idiot. I go, well, I'm off to Safari. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. That was And another... Lauren was like, you can't just say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. It was a whole character. Yeah, yeah I saw, I saw Conan, the Conan, if you're listening, Conan goes, hey, he's just saying a catchphrase. He was desperate for a catchphrase. No, Conan, there was a whole character <laughs> behind it. It was the richest man in the world, and he's an idiot. There was a character. And I had a line when I, they go, I go, oh, Phil was in that sketch. They go, they go, what do we do while you're gone? I go, mm, and I had a Kit Kat, but I go, bye, Kit Kat. So then Phil and Whitney Brown are, are sitting there go, can you believe we work for this? No, Phil gets on the phone first. Right. He goes, yeah, buy, a, buy Kit Kat. 
And then when he goes, can you believe we work for this idiot? idiot. He's such a moron. And the phone rings, Phil goes, I know, he's an idiot. Phil what? Goes, Hello? What? Oh, you're kidding. Whitney goes, what? And Phil goes, Kit Kat just went up 300 million. <laughs> then I come back in, <laughs> so and everybody, dumb. I forgot my wallet. Right, and then they go, <laughs> and then they go, Kit Kat just went up 300 million. I go, oh, you see, buy what you love and you can't go wrong. Well, Lauren, well, Lauren thought that was the funniest thing. He, he died with Died that. laughing. Yeah. And he goes, you can't just say goodbye, everybody, goodbye. The next year, a man named David Spade. Oh, boy, I know what's oh, coming. Does a sketch bye -bye. where he's on it and says, bye-bye, bye-bye, bye, -bye, bye, -bye, well, bye, -bye. wait a minute. Bye. Goodbye, everybody, I'm goodbye. I'm not saying you took it from me. And then I get on the me. airplane phone and I go, bye, Almond Joy. 300 million. No, I'm not oh, saying you joy. took it from me. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> Buy a hundred I'm saying they let bar. you do that, but he, Lauren, was, he wouldn't let me do a goodbye. Lauren goes, goodbye. you're my savior. Everything about that is great. John did this weak, I go, wispy I'm bit. I'm saying goodbye, everybody, year. goodbye. And he's saying goodbye. Of all the sketches with uh, the goodbye word in it, it's in the top five. So goodbye then when I did is, Evelyn mm, Quinn's- And bye-bye. Mm, at run. the end of it, the character did Tales of Ribaldry, which, which John Bowman, who sadly passed away, wrote, and Christine Zander. They wrote a great sketch. What did he that sound like? Hello, I'm <laughs> He sounds Quinn. a little bit like the other guys. Welcome to Tales of <laughs> Ribaldry. Definitely definite 1940s. Yeah, same guy as Mr. Camby. Yeah, Eric Blore, this actor. I would see all the actors. I want to play them. No, Eric it was Blore. a higher pitch. He was, was in a lot of um, like Fred Astaire movies. Hello. So at the end of it, I go, we'll be back next week with another, you know, Tales of Ribaldry. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. You so try I to stuck it in at the it in end. There? And they said the whole control booth was cheering him because I finally got it in. Because you got it back. It. You know, so mad. I go, I'll get it on Boy, the air. You he's a jolly. Like, uh, it didn't help me uh, with the show, you know. Please. Remember, I'd always say, I'd always talk back to Lauren. So you were out of fun. We would say, everyone would say their ideas on a Monday. And I go, wait, wait. He, wait. Lauren goes, what? I go, what are your ideas? And Dana would look at me like, <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it. How much back shit to would Lauren. you give our boss? I know, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what about you, Lauren? What do you got? <laughs> you know. Um. All right, let's do a good show because it's better well, to do a good show than a bad they, show. I was mad because they wouldn't... Uh, Give us credit as writers. I could just put my name on there. At home. Nope. Uh, I got a credit. <laughs> Only one time. Bloop. When when I was voted the most <laughs> racist comedian of 1986 because of Ching Change. Right. And they said, Saturday Night Live released a statement. Dana Carvey's Ching Change. <laughs> so I, I wrote, got ownership. <laughs> yeah. when I got nominated. You, the only thing you wrote all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah and, and, and you Carvey's base that. Ching you go, change, how is it racist? You go, it's a real guy that you met that had a pet store yeah and he was asian yeah, and that's like, how there he was no, no stereotypical no thing in it well John, that's the thing now acting is considered racist if you play a character that you're not so i could i could you'd have one i could play one part once mm -hmm. you can't just gonna you can't just play a fat guy all the over. time you know and then anything else is you know you're not that right right you just have to play yourself people go you're not really this you're not really that i go well i'm not i'm not really any of the people you I've can't ever just played. play a buffoon the rest of your life you have to mix it up right i have to wait what 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 how dare you you know this has been a great time <laughs> wrap up Dana, well i'm sorry up. david david <laughs> spade that you're upset that I'm so much better at golf than you oh yeah what do people Wayne don't know about right, david Phil hartman that you know what would you like people to know about your friend yeah, Phil a, Hartman? In your final moments, what would you say? He had a huge heart <laughs> that they don't know. Um, well, well, as, Phil was as kind talented of reserved. as he was, yeah. he was equally modest. And, you know, he was, he loved to laugh. You and I made him laugh, like cry laugh. He loved that. And he was a fan of people. He was not competitive at all. No, I had no. But he was ego. the best, you know. He was just. He, uh, I would say. Well, they never saw him do improv when he was in the Groundlings, uh, and then I remember I, I got in the company. So the first half of the show was sketches, and then the second half was all improv. So Tom Maxwell was the artistic director, so he'd like say, "John, you and so and so get on stage, you and so and so." So then there'd be uh, he'd go, "Okay, uh, Phil." Phil and someone else and someone else on stage. And the rest of us were sitting, you sit on the floor at the, on the, on, at the base of the stage, you know, mm. waiting to be called up. And um, so whenever he would call Phil, 
We was it was real improv. Second city, I was there once. They get it. They they get suggestions and they go backstage for forty five minutes and write it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, I go. That's not improv. You gotta just go. So they'd say, "What? Where are they? They're in a department store. This and this. Lights out. Come up. You go." Yeah. And everybody would be talking, and Phil <laughs> wouldn't say anything. But but we were all waiting. We knew he was going to say something, mm-hmm. and that you would never imagine, and it would be hysterical. So we're all waiting. And you just see Phil, he's just thinking, and you could see he's getting like, I don't know why, just angrier and angrier. And then all of a sudden he go, yeah, well, I think that, da, 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 blah. and he would just explode in anger. And it, like the point where his face was beat red, you can see the vein in his forehead and just screaming. And it was just hysterical. And it was, it was just and we'd all be on the floor dying laughing. We'd go like, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? Because the, the improv would start and he's not saying anything. And we're all mm-hmm. just going, man, he's he had he here. Mm-hmm. It's coming any second now. And then just like something like you'd never were you, imagine. Were you there brilliant. the night? He was just the best improviser. And Tim Stack was in the company, was great. The best guy besides Phil. And I said, but Tim, I go, wasn't Phil like amazing? He goes, he goes oh, he was on another level. There's a the dog. John yeah, the dog. Were you yeah. there the yeah. night the we all decided everything. to make Neil Young laugh? Was it Phil? I know that Phil and I remember we were at dinner with Neil Young for some reason, and I said, "Let's make, let's like." Oh, make I was Neil at that Young. Dinner. I remember being at a. And after Phil party. was doing like a Japanese pilot. He was doing, you know could do all these voices and characters, and we got Neil Young just helpless. Come on, fellas. <laughs> was he laughing? <laughs> yeah, laughing his ass off. <laughs> I'm helpless. Helpless. We Sorry. couldn't invite everyone. It was just a hundred people. I, the animal that was in our studio. We apologize for the yeah. behavior and the audio John's technical dog, difficulties. Jerry just chewed Heather's leg off. Jerry and, wasn't getting enough attention and decided to take revenge. He's now outside in a plastic punishment. David room. and Dana are two human mm. beings with their own podcast, and yet they're jealous of my twelve-year-old, fifteen-pound dog, Jerry. Here's John's Jerry new Brooke. Bit. I'm going to throw more credits than Omaha the two of them together. <laughs> this is my imitation of you two. Go ahead. We're, we're interviewing John Lovitz. Pinch me, pinch me. Does John, life you remember get any my, better than John, you, called pinch you me. remember my impression of you I would do all the time when we were teasing each other at SNL? I go, quick impression of you. What's going on? What, what are we doing? I don't know. I'm scared. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> what a burn. <laughs> Yeah. I'd say it's my best it impression. Brings me right back to the show. I think we can use all that, Greg. <laughs> all right, John, I got to go. Let's just see yourself out. Yes, and I will see myself to your John Lovitz coming to. Uh, let's wall. just say it. He's at the Tropicana. He's a uh, in a residency there. Watch for him in Las Vegas in the Laugh Factory mm-hmm. at the uh, uh, in in the Tropicana Hotel, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Once a month. Oh, and I'm on a game show now mm-hmm. with the Byron <coughs> Allen Company. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should ask. Is that the just name? Just tell of it? jokes. That's Is that the name, the name of, the show. of it. It's like Hollywood Squares, but it's just. There's no tic tac toe, and there's Channel six, six comedians. I've already Denver. told you this. No, that's the name of the show. Are they, aren't those on in the middle of the night? Like on that's the name of the show. Yeah, like three in the afternoon <laughs> and two in the morning. Two in the morning <laughs> for insomniacs. It's a funny show, though. It's fun. Uh, they shoot they got great is. comics. Of Whitney Cummings on there. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, t- Tiffany Haddish, Howie Mandel, Louis mm-hmm. Anderson. God bless him was on it. Mm-hmm. Scott hey. Satin, who sadly passed away, created the show. Byron Allen, mm-hmm. hey. been great nice. to me, produces it. Billy Gardell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody but you two. From Molly and Mike or something. You turn it down. All right, I'm going to leave. So everyone give me about All right. a right, John Lovitz has been our... Thanks for coming on, John. John, thank you, you so much. My pleasure. You two have fun making love after the show like you always do. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13, executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 